Okay. Let's bring that down. Okay. Let's do this. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we are going to be making another painting by another one of my very, very favorite artists. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy. He's very obscure. Um, you know, it's... Uh, but I really want to try to do my best to to bring him to your attention because I think he's really worth uh, a closer examination. His name is Vincent Van Gogh. I, I know it's 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 a very obscure artist. We're really going into the into the <laughs> nether regions of the art world to find some uh, hidden gems here. Uh, all kidding aside, Vincent Van Gogh is probably the most famous, most popular artist of all time. Certainly these days, um, there have been other artists in the past who were very popular in their own time. Uh, Van Gogh, however, and famously, um, died in obscurity. Was was um, the, the the as the myth goes, he only sold one painting during his lifetime, and never got to uh, witness or experience the celebrity and fame that has has come since his passing, over a hundred and thirty years ago, I guess. Actually, this week. Is uh, we're, we're, is all dedicated to Vincent Van Gogh or Vincent Van Gogh, I think, as it's more correctly pronounced in the original Dutch. Um, but uh, we are going to be painting four. <laughs> I have to look at my fingers. We're going to be painting four Vincent Van Gogh paintings over the course of this next week, and we're going to start with his sort of first big hit here, and it is called. The Potato Eaters. And uh, for some people, this might not be the most recognizable painting that he did. There's sunflowers, there's irises, there is um, uh, many, many self-portraits, his bedroom, night cafe, paintings of some of his um, friends and doctors. But so here's the painting that we're going to be making. Now, if you already know a little bit about Vincent van Gogh, and I'll call him Vincent van Gogh, just uh, van Gogh always sounds a little bit, I feel a little bit pretentious saying that, even though I think it's much closer to the original. But um, uh, if you know anything about Vincent van Gogh, this is really his first big masterpiece. This is the painting Vincent worked on for uh, I guess about a year of his life um, he didn't actually he wasn't painting on this surface of this canvas for a year but he made probably about six or seven other versions of this painting he made small little sketches focusing on different faces um, and lots of sketches on paper. So he did sketches as, as with oil sketches and graphite or charcoal sketches on paper. So he really saw this as his uh, magnum opus at this point in his career. So we see this is April 1885. Really, he's only been painting for a, or dedicated himself to painting for about two years, I think, at this point. And he really wanted to put everything he knew into this painting as a way of creating kind of a, a calling card for an artist. And without getting in, into the weeds on it, one of the things, you know, if you think uh, back to how art used to be in the Western world, is that there were these giant salons and artists would up, would submit their work they would apply to exhibit their latest work in the in this year's salon and you'd have um you know usually one or two of these massive exhibitions that were held in like uh what would be the equivalent today kind of like a giant convention center and you'd have thousands of paintings and they would be hung on the wall kind of on top of one another which is which is now we call salon style where you literally have paintings 
right down to the ground and then they're on, stacked up all the way up to the ceiling and sometimes even not like literally right up to the ceiling and even kind of a little bit onto the ceiling itself so that was kind of the conditions that van gogh was creating his work and you would hope to, like as a as a relatively young artist i think he's in his early 30s at this point you know he's some you would submit your work you would get exhibited in the salon hopefully it's it's was chosen for the salon because most of the work would be rejected by the salon even by some of the great artists and this work would be hung on the wall and then people would come by and go wow that's a great painting that's an amazing artist let's really look into him and maybe buy some of his work none of that really happened for him unfortunately um and we'll get all in there's a lot to talk about just with this painting alone now before we we're gonna make we're gonna paint this painting and there is an outline that i did i traced that painting on my ipad using the app procreate because people ask me all the time how i do this so i just bring it into procreate and use my apple pencil and i just quickly go over all the lines and then you can print this out and then we're going to transfer it onto the canvas now i've already done this for a bunch of the upcoming episodes just because it takes a little bit of time to do i'm going to show you a clip of how that's done just so if you're interested oh no i closed that okay so let's open it up again <laughs> um had it all queued up and right no nope, that's not what i want to do either that's uh open in the wrong app Continue. Look at that. Every, all the best plans. <laughs> okay, so let's. I'm going to show you this on the big screen here. Oh, that's a, a hint of a painting we're going to be doing at the very end of August. Okay, so well, I think we'll just play this here. So I'm painting on 9 by 12 sized canvas. And we're going to be painting it landscape format, obviously, because that's the format of the actual painting itself. And then here's the image. Sometimes when I'm doing these paintings, I, I, I'm very conscious of trying to make sure it's not crooked. Uh, so I use a ruler if there's a straight horizontal line. that, that um, But this painting, I don't think, uh, requires any special... <laughs> um, thought, I guess, in terms of how you uh, uh, orient the painting onto the page. I basically put it right in the center. And then you can see here, I'm going to use some carbon paper. I got this from a local dollar store here in Vancouver, Canada, where my studio is. And, you know, it cost maybe four or five bucks for 12 of these. You should be able to get this from any art supply store. I've got a link for it in the video description below if you want to order one directly from Amazon. And you can reuse these sheets probably, you know, about somewhere between 10 to 20 times before uh, they run out. And you can see there, that one that I was using before had finally been used one too many times. Okay, so then I'm going to just go over all of these. Well, I would say maybe 70% of the lines. I'm not going to go over every single line because we're going to a lot of those lines are, are so small like you can see some of the wrinkles on the shirts are kind of uh not really particularly important because we're going to lose all that when we paint it and then sometimes you got to reposition the carbon paper or graphite paper and you can get you should be able to get this also from uh, your local uh, fabric store as well they also sell carbon paper graphite paper for transferring pr uh, prints or patterns onto fabric and there you go okay so now that we've we've got our image onto the canvas and let's see from above all right that's what it'll look like and then you can take this and and you you could certainly throw it in the recycling bin or you could paint over top of it you could use this as a test you know when you're mixing colors you could just kind of add little dabs here and there sometimes i keep them around and available so that i can refer to it as i'm painting like oh yeah that's that's what that is okay cool i'll also let you know that tomorrow 
we're going to be painting uh, Vincent's bedroom and then on Wednesday we're going to be painting the uh, cafe terrace at night another both of those are super famous and then um, I don't I guess I did, moved it away uh, the uh, and there's a self a very famous self portrait of his that's at the Art Institute of Chicago that we're, we'll be painting on Thursday. So that gives us four of Van Gogh's most famous paintings of all time. We also did a uh, we also painted maybe back in September Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night, and we did that one relatively quickly. I think we did that in about two hours. So. This painting, just as a heads up, is probably a three and a half hour painting. Um, there's a lot of detail in these figures. Now, we're, I'm, my goal is to make these, these episodes, these classes, as, as straightforward and simple for even a beginner painter. Um, I think there's this idea that it, for a beginner artist, everything should be really fast. There should be an hour long episode, hour and a half long episode. This is going to take us a little bit longer because there's a lot of detail in there, but it doesn't mean it's going to be that much more complicated. I think one of the great things with Vincent van Gogh's art is how relatively straightforward the paintings are. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, even though it, if you, you're certainly welcome to stop the video at any time, take a break, watch it again later, these videos will be up there for as long as the internet <laughs> exists. My hope, anyway, you never know with the way that the, the world is, but um, you can certainly, you know, the other thing I also recommend is if you're watching this video after it was recorded, you can also just jump right to the end, take a look at the at how it looks, and then decide for yourself if I know what I'm talking about and you want to follow along with the lesson. I think this is the painting number 104 that we've been doing over the past uh, 11, 9, 10 months, somewhere around there. And there's been a few that I've definitely, um, I'm not super happy with, but I think overall, in general, I think uh, they're, they turn out pretty good. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so the other thing I want to just mention before, okay, so if you were wondering, how do I get this mystical outline, this, um, there is a Dropbox folder that's, and there's a link in the description below, and you can scroll down in there, and you'll see paintings by, let's see, let's, can we move this over, Giorgio O'Keefe. Leonardo da Vinci, Salvador Dali, Robert Bateman, Batman by Bob Kane, uh, Star Wars, the original illustrator, uh, Ralph McQuarrie, who did all the original illustrations for that. Chi by Chi, probably one of the greatest Chinese painters of all time, at least in modern art history. Um, Goya, another giant classical painter from the late... I guess uh, the Romantic period, 7, 18, early 1800s. And then we did a whole week on Tom Thompson. If you really like these, you want to dive into some work by some uh, by one artist in particular. And then here we are, Vincent van Gogh. And, of course, on Sunday, we're to celebrate Spider-Man Day. We're going to do a Spider-Man pa painting. And then we've got more stuff coming down the pipeline, including a whole month looking at... The great art from Latin America, uh, uh, Hispanic art, um, and we're going to be looking at Muslim artists. So we're going on a trip around the world looking at different cultures, different races, different genders, trying to be as inclusive as possible so that if you get a little bit of taste for Van Gogh and you're like, who are some of the other great artists out there? Well, there's a great playlist here of artists to choose from. Did I not share this on, on camera? Okay. Uh, here's, this is the Dropbox folder here that I was talking about um, of all the different artists that you can uh, you can look up. So that, that link is down in the description below. Also let you know there's a Facebook group that I encourage you to join if you're watching right now. I'd love for you to make today's painting, upload your version of today's painting, and in a couple of weeks we're gonna be looking at the results from artists like yourself who've made some of the paintings that we've done as well as their own paintings that they've been working on in their own spare time as well so 
Uh, I think this might also be just kind of a good, uh, just quick, I, I made this last night, just so people know when these episodes are happening, because usually I'm on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. Pacific time, Vancouver, Los Angeles time, and uh, then I sometimes do these bonus episodes on Mondays and Wednesdays and Sundays and Fridays, and so I'm going to try to make that as clear as possible when I'm doing Generally, if I'm not painting on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's not at 4 o'clock. <laughs> okay, Van Gogh, just as a quick thing here. Died at age 37, born 1853, 1890. So you can see the painting we're doing is his first great masterpiece, and it was made just five years before he died. Right, So he really was only painting for about five, six, seven years of his life and really at his height only for the last five years or you could even argue the last two or three years really um, because today's painting is from is is looks maybe a little bit different than some of the paintings you're familiar with. Okay so lots of links here. I think let's get right into the painting here because there's only so much talking that people want to hear me do. So, um, I know that this is this will be an episode where there will be a lot of new people who are going to be tuning in and watching me for the very first time. Most of my episodes, about 60 to 70% of the viewers are people who've never seen, seen me before, never tuned in to one of these episodes before. And... Uh, that can be a little bit confusing to, to understand the system that I use. So I always try my best to make things ex as accessible as possible for people. Um, and I know sometimes it leads to a little bit of repetition for people. Uh, what I really want to do is one of these days make a video where I... Um, like a five minute intro at the beginning of every episode that would sort of just give a real brief summary so I don't have to repeat myself over and over and people don't have to hear me repeat myself <laughs> over and over um, okay so I'll just let you know what I'm up to here generally at the beginning of every painting most artists most professional artists anyway will you know we've got our canvas with our drawing on on the canvas transferred onto the canvas most artists including Van Gogh would prime it with um, and with some color to get it started, like a like a wash, to 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 get rid of the white the that is often the paralyzing thing. Like oh my goodness, the white of the canvas. So and there's many different reasons why people do this, and I've talked about this ad nauseum episode to episode. But uh, this is really, you just saw me pour a little bit of water. This is where I mix my brushes, right in here. And you'll see that over the course of the next three hours or more, I won't wash, or I won't empty that water, I won't change it, I won't... Um, and so just keep an eye on that, because I think a lot of people think you need to put a lot of water into your acrylic paints. And so I try not to put water in my acrylics whenever possible except really at the beginning here when I'm putting making this wash probably a better even better solution would be to use acrylic medium as opposed to water but that's again discussion for another day uh, or discussions that I've had in previous days so what I did is I just took some warm yellow you can see I've written warm on it now this yellow is kind of an orangey yellow that's why it's a warm yellow as opposed to our cool yellow, right? Which has got a bit of a greenish, bluish cast to it. And I know you're like, really? That's green or blue? It's 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 very, very subtle, almost imperceptible. But the one thing that we know for sure is it has no orange or red pigment in the in the cold at all, unlike the warm one, right? And we'll have these conversations throughout the episode, just for those of you that are uh, new to painting. Okay, so I'm going to take this warm color, and I'm just going to quickly paint it all over this surface here. 
The reason why I add a little bit of water is to thin it down, Prime, both because um, I don't want to obscure any of my pencil lines. The other thing is that it'll dry much faster. It'll dry within maybe two minutes, three minutes, and if I put the hair dryer on it, it'll be dry within about 30 seconds. And when I'm painting uh, live like this, I want to, <laughs> to try to cut down as much of the uh, the dead time as possible so people aren't saying like, wow, exciting, I'm watching paint dry and this guy just babble on endlessly. Wow, that's a, a winning formula. <laughs> so I'm, I try to, as best as possible, to speed up these processes. If you were painting at home, you wouldn't necessarily need to put some water in there. Yellow is generally a fairly transparent color anyway. So, um, okay. So, Van Gogh probably did not use a yellow, because I know some people are like, hey, wait a second. This guy's spreading false information out there and presenting himself as a as an expert when he's not. Um, Van Gogh, especially at this period of time in his career, was using a very limited palette. The painting that we're going to be looking at here was done with very um, mostly browns and blues and very earthy reds that are basically brown right and a little bit of yellow so he would not he probably didn't even have access to a color like this he would have there there are some versions of yellow that can be almost as bright as this but he probably wasn't just technically able to get a color quite this bright at least in this point of time in his career um but I love this type of a color, this nice bright yellow, because it's going to infuse this painting with a nice warmth to it. Almost like an Instagram filter that kind of gives it that 70s look, that Kodak, Kodachrome kind of quality. So I love using a warm yellow. If you wanted, you could certainly use um, a, a earthy red, like a... Like a, a um, kind of like the, I've been looking at the color of my... like. So this here's the color of my tea with a little bit of milk in there, right? And artists would probably use something maybe a little bit closer to this. Now, it wouldn't be that dark. Obviously, it, it would be much lighter once we spread it onto the canvas. Okay. I'm just seeing here in the chat... Um, Paula says, I went out for a walk and I saw eight or nine airplanes doing an air show. It was a spectacular surprise. I think there's a big air show happening in Abbotsford this sometime. There are, there's always something like that, right? Uh, there's Maria joining us here. Susan says, hi. Paula says, it's fun that we're digging into Van Gogh's paintings this week. Maria says, it took me an hour to draw the outline onto this painting. I can, I, I, That's why I definitely wanted to speed that process up. And then Susan says, was he considered an impressionist painter? Great, uh, great question. Um, how about, I'll answer your question and then I'll blow dry this just to speed this up. Uh, or actually, you know what, I'm gonna blow dry it. It'll take maybe 20 seconds and then I'll answer your question, Susan. So, let's, yeah, that's fine. I think. Yeah. I'm going to mute my microphone so it doesn't blow out your, your speech.
Okay, there's still a few little patches of paint here. In fact, I'm just going to take my brush and just see if I can... Some of that I put on a little bit heavier. There we go. Dry enough. Okay. I'm just going to give it a little bit more water here. Okay. So Susan's question was, Van Gogh an impressionist painter? Um, Van Gogh is generally considered a post-impressionist painter. So impressionism begins, let's say, 1850-ish, 1860, and goes till around 1880, 1890, and then post-impressionism is sort of overlapping that in a weird way. Um, the main difference between impressionism and probably the most famous impressionist painter is Claude Monet, who did the water lilies, right? Um, the main difference between impressionism and post-impressionism and, and, and there have been exhibitions where you'll see something like Claude Monet and Van Gogh or Impressionism to post-impressionism, the, the lines are, are very blurry, right? So, but just to kind of get, if you really want the, the as specific as a po possible, the main difference is that post-impressionism happens to be a little bit more expressive. Uh, and Van Gogh is, is, the, is the, the, the most famous of the post-impressionists. Another artist would be his friend, uh, Paul Gauguin. Um, and I think even even though Van Gogh is the most famous post-impressionist, Gauguin is maybe a best the, a better example of post-impressionism because a lot of Gauguin's paintings are kind of from his imagination, uh, from memory, or from his uh, his his kind of secret desires, a little bit perverse desires. He was, you know, a 50-year-old man who moved to Tahiti and hung out with a lot of underage girls, right? Um, so, but uh, uh, a lot of, like, Gauguin's paintings are very fanciful, and he painted many of those paintings, some, well, not, maybe a, a number of them when he was in France thinking about Tahiti, and whereas a lot of the Impressionist paintings were made standing looking at things, as Van Gogh often did himself. Anyway, so let's move into the painting. Let's put some uh, paint onto the, onto the palette here. So I'm going to, even though this, the painting we're about to do is a little bit on the darker side, I'm still going to use probably most of the colors that I have um, to do this painting. Now, Van Gogh, at the time he made this, uh, the Potato Eaters, would, would have been using, as I said, a very limited, very dark palette. And when, just, just as an aside, when people talk about a limited color palette, they're, they're referring to, a, there's a, and sometimes people use it in very different ways. Most of the time, the way that I think about a limited color palette is literally you're using a very limited number of colors. Like in this case, I have eight tubes of paint and I've done all 104 episodes using eight tubes of paint. And, and many of them I've used even just six tubes of paint. Um, not because I try as much as possible not to use my uh, black whenever possible for various reasons. Now we're probably going to use black in this painting. This tube of paint looks like it has reached its end. Not the same one. It's funny, sometimes these paints look a little bit different. And which is not surprising that it's that sometimes they as they mix these in huge machines, that sometimes the pigment might be a little bit darker or brighter or more or less intense. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm going to save the, uh, the black for the very end of the painting, if possible. Because 
the way that I like to work, and this is not just some fantasy that I created, but I would say a lot of painters work from the background to the foreground. So what that allows you to do is eventually overlap shapes. And overlapping shapes is one way that we can tell that something is in front of the other, like my hands, right? If this, my left hand here, <clears throat> is behind my right hand, then we know that the left hand is further away from, let's say, the camera here than my right hand, maybe just by a little bit. And even if we do something a little bit like this, where the, these, this, these fingers on my right hand are just a little bit over my left hand, we know that this is still a little bit further into the background. All right, so um, overlapping shapes by putting working on the background first, we push the background in behind the foreground and middle ground. Okay, so let's look at this painting and just think about how we want to progress here. And I'll take a sip of tea. So, mostly, I think what we're going to do is we're going to mix a few colors. We're going to mix a cold, just to, well, just to give you a quick idea, what we're going to do is we're going to mix some browns. We're going to mix a cold brown and a warm brown. We're also going to mix a cold gray and a warm gray. I've mentioned this before, but, you know, a lot of older paintings, um, pre-impressionist period, so kind of pre-1850 or so, tend to be quite dark paintings, like we're looking at right here. They often have maybe 90% of the painting is a combination of bray, <laughs> bray, brown and gray. That's a, Maybe that's a new word, bray, for a combination of brown and gray. Um, so most paintings would have brown and gray as their predominant color with just uh, a little bit of brighter colors kind of popping in, be in, in and around there. The impression, one of the big things that happens with impressionists or around the 1850s or, or a little bit earlier, but the, is the, is the pre-packaged tube of paint, right? So rather than artists having to grind all their own pigments, they could just go out to the store, buy a tube of paint, put it in their backpack, go for a hike into the mountains, pull out their tubes of paint and canvas, make a painting on the spot. That was revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary. I mean, it's I, the it would be, it's it's like the telephone. Remember when, if you wanted to get a hold of somebody, you had to call them at their work or at home, because their phone was plugged into the wall, right? <laughs> Most of us who are a little bit older remember what that was like, and you miss a phone call, and then you know you're really hard to get a hold. Now, we have phones that we can put in our pockets and carry around. We could be on climbing a mountain, or we could be on a boat, and we can make a phone call. Think about how much more convenient that is, right? Same sort of thing with artists and tubes of paint. Being able to, to bring your studio on your back and go anywhere just transformed not, not only uh, the artist's working process, but the kinds of paintings they were able to make. Think about how difficult it would be to make a landscape painting or even a painting like this but when you had to be in a studio, like literally within arm's reach of your materials to, to mix them and pour little mixtures like a scientist, it would be, you'd have to kind of like, oh, what did those clouds look like today? I have to take a mental picture, rush back to my studio and paint it. When you have all this stuff in your bag, you can just pull it out and start mixing it right there. Okay, so let's, I'm, I'm so excited because this is, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite artists. Um, so I'm. So I apologize. I'm doing a little bit of rambling. Okay. So let's. We want to put uh, our cool colors into the background. So we're going to start out. We're going to mix a cool brown to start out, and then we're going to transform that into a cool gray, and we're going to apply that in the background. Now the the I think the brown that I'm going to make is also going to be a little predominantly red. I think or predominantly green because in this painting you can see there's a kind of a green cast to a lot of it, a lot of the the painting so to do that um, let's 
Let's actually do it like this. Here's the start. Let's take some of this cool yellow and let's do this right here. So I've got my cool yellow and I'm going to take my cool blue. I'm going to mix them together. And we get this nice cool green. And it's like an electric green. I think sometimes people think of cool colors as very subdued quiet colors and that's not the case at all um cool colors can in this case this is probably one of the most vibrant colors in the entire color palette is using the cool yellow and cool blue to make this fl almost fluorescent uh green so this is great but obviously if we tried to paint this color um side by side here it would be ridiculous right it's just way too too intense of a color so we need to dial it back a little bit so one of the ways that we can pull the intensity out of that color is we can add s some red to it and turn it into a bit of a brown and that will be it'll pull it towards the center of the color wheel which we call the neutral core All right so adding a little bit of that red already kind of you know it's not quite as saturated it looks a little bit more um, of a kind of green we might see in nature. Put a little bit more red into it, and now we start looking, it looks like maybe uh, grass, like in the shadows. Let's put a little bit more red into it. And this is my cold red, right? Just keeping this color nice and cold. And we keep going like this, and now the color starting to look maybe a lot like the color that's in the painting right if it keeps if it stays really intense then we can just uh, add a little bit more red now obviously if we just keep on adding more red to it it's eventually going to go from green into a brown right kind of like that but actually i don't mind this right now because we're gonna we're gonna be using this color a lot the same mixture of cool yellow, cool blue, and cool red uh, for this background. So let's see. Let's move that out of the way. I'm going to go to a slightly smaller brush. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be painting this color all over the background. And we might be adding a little bit more red to it to make it even more brown. And then on the other side, we might add a little bit more yellow to it to brighten it back up and bring it back towards the greenish side, so adding more, more blue to it. Now, I'm not super concerned about getting the right mixtures at this point, because in all likelihood, I'm gonna have to paint over a few things here. This color is relatively transparent. Um, and there's a lot of this detail that I'm painting right now is um, is stuff that is, I don't want to say unimportant, but is is things that I wouldn't I don't think we're gonna need to spend too long focusing on now I know some people it's like that's sacrilege to say but um, we, we have to make some concessions while we're making this painting uh, to focus like the, the primary aspect of this painting is the the potato eaters the people that are sitting around the table eating dinner Right, we know this is about seven o'clock at night, according to the clock on the wall. It's dinner time. These are, are peasants from a relatively poor agricultural area of southern Holland. Um, uh, and Van Gogh fancied himself, he wanted to be like the painter of the people. He, Van Gogh, at, at this point in time, Van Gogh has decided, you know what, I want to be an artist. I want to be a painter. Prior to this, kind of like the, the decade before 
you know, in his 20s, he was sort of like like a lot of 20-somethings today, sort of a little bit directionless, not really sure what he wanted to do in life, um, and was thinking about becoming a, a priest, and became a missionary, and was sent to a coal mining town in Holland, where he, he wanted to preach to the locals, um, and spread the word of God to to these poor, to this very very poor working class neighborhood where, or, or town where like the death rates were were unnaturally high because of of uh, you know the coal dust that the miners were breathing in and the you know there's being a, a coal miner is a dangerous uh, occupation right and. One of the things when Van Gogh got to that small town, that mining town, and sort of took his residency as a missionary, is that uh, he was offered this, you know, a fairly, you know, as luxurious of uh, a quarters as maybe a missionary could have, and uh, he he rejected it. He he. Because he looked around and he saw, like, basically everyone else is on the verge of starvation. Who's going to want to... to, to who's going to take me seriously if I'm walking around in, in, in uh, nice, clean robes and eating well and have this big, nice place to stay in where everyone else is, is you know, on the, the, the edge of, of destitution? So he instead like was sleeping on the floor on the hay. He 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 renounced all of these sort of comforts, and that upset the 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 church, who felt that it was um, debasing the 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 church or it was disrespectful okay so just as a, real quickly you could see i've added i mixed this color and it's a little bit more on the brown side and it's obviously it's different than i did that unintentionally but i also i don't really care at this point if it's a little bit more brown a little bit more green um i could i could very easily just add more blue and yellow to this to brighten it up my goal at this stage is is just to paint in the background. So don't worry about your colors not being quote unquote perfect because we're probably gonna have to do two layers of uh, of this here. And you know I can understand I understand that um, that philosophy of the church right like that they would want they, what they want is people to be like in awe and in uh, deep respect for the church that the church represents something you know uh, you know the the ultimate in in society in culture and um, and there and the, the priests themselves should be you know model citizens or not even model citizens but almost like above uh, everyone in in the, the so that people have this like deep respect and but van gogh did not see it that way he he said he thought like i need to be more like the people around me so that they can i i can identify with them and uh so, so th but the church yeah again did not agree with that whole thing and he was basically kicked out of the of the what do you call it? The missionary service or whatever, which was a big blow to him. He wasn't, so he did not become a priest. And I'm just going over some of this dark with just this brown, just kind of darkening all this down here. And I think that whole, that incident of him and his relationship with the church, 
I think tells you a lot about Van Gogh's personality. Um, about his... This, this like, deep need for, like... He, he really wanted to live this, like, authentic life. And he, he wrote a lot about, like, the search for truth and meaning. And... Um, he believed in living a fairly austere life. Now, one of the things, people always think of Van Gogh as a starving artist, and it's true, he didn't have a lot of money, but he did have the support of his brother, w without whom he would have been, like, uh, he would have been literally starving. His brother supported him throughout most of his life, so Van Gogh did not have to work. Basically, um, from 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 the point that he he didn't get into the become a, a, a priest so he was very fortunate that his brother supported him and so when people talk about how he was this kind of starving artist it's like yeah but he was also very lucky to have a, a very supportive brother that um, helped him through so much of his life, right? Let's see. So, you know, I know I'm painting over a bunch of small little details here, and so you're probably like, well, what's the point of even... Like, why provide a drawing that has so many lines on it? Well, if some people work in very different ways, so I want to provide them with as much information as possible, and then people can... Di um, um, remove details if they want. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's put... Okay, so this gives you an idea of just sort of where I'm going here so far. I think maybe I'll just put a little bit more green and yellow. I'll mix this here off to the side. Just bring a bit of that color in here. Maybe I'm just going to go down to an even smaller brush. Right, so I always start big. What is the biggest area I can cover as quickly as possible? And then once I've got that in, then I'm going to move to the next biggest area. And again, these you could be painting this brown, and you could have... The, this the other colors could be green. I'm just applying um, kind of dark greens and browns and trying to just to divide this space up into smaller spaces or into these various different colors to establish because um, most of this is going to be very dark by the end. To the point where, you know, you could probably just paint a lot of this almost totally black. But I want to try to get as close as possible to the original. So there's no particular rhyme and reason as to why I'm painting these colors, where I'm painting them. I'm just painting in dark browns, dark greens, just to kind of get everything going here. Should just paint right over that. Even this lampshade. I'll keep the inside of it um, unpainted. We'll put some white in there. And even though there's this sort of halo of light in front of this small girl who's standing at the table, which is apparently was quite common. That was the 
little kids would stand at the dinner table while their parents would eat at the dinner table, which I think is kind of funny. Um, I know if, if we tried to have our daughter standing at the dinner table eating with us, we probably should. I don't know if, if she would she would just waste away. She wouldn't get any food in her, so. Um, different world, too. You know, this child probably also worked in the fields, worked in the mines. Um, so, again, I'm just using these different colors to help me see where these different shapes are going to be so that later on um, I can I like oh that's where the clock goes Really, my, my main goal at this stage is just to paint in as much of the surface as possible so that we have basically everything covered in, in paint by, by the time we get to the next stage of the painting. Um, okay. So what we've done here is we've painted cold colors in our background. Right? And... Um, I think that's good. I think that's good for right now. So let me just think about what we want to do next. Um, so my my the debate I'm having in my mind right now, just for uh, just so you can clue you in as to what's going on inside <laughs> inside here is I'm trying to think to myself now should I move on from the background like keep the background like this for now and then paint the characters in the foreground next or should uh, I, I um, finish the background or at least take it to a, get it closer to being finished and then paint the, the foreground. Um, generally, what I do is I would move right now directly into the foreground and start painting these guys. My only worry is that a beginner artist might struggle a little bit. Because what, what we're going to do is now we're going to paint some warm browns and... Uh, not too much green, mostly browns, warm reds in the foreground. Actually, it'll probably be different enough, I think. But I just want to make... I, I'm, uh, I don't want to lose too much detail here, because that might be really difficult for people. Yeah, let's... I think we'll be okay. I, I'll, I'll sit, Maybe I'll put the faces aside. We'll do the faces later. And that will help people see where things are. Okay, so let's do that. So let's just wash up some of these brushes. Like generally, like if I was painting this myself, I would just launch right in and just start, I would basically cover everything with paint, with various um, browns and greens and dark blues. Um, because I have confidence as a, as a professional artist of been painting for over 25 years exhibiting and selling and all that kind of stuff and I have confidence in my own ability to be able to um, find those details and and to look at the original and go oh, okay well so there's this I can paint that hat there but I know that for beginner artists if we were just to paint all of this really dark they're like, oh my goodness, now I, I don't know where the hand is, I'm like lost, and now I'm feeling really upset, and I feel like I'm not very good. And so I really, I, those are the feelings I want as best as possible to avoid. I really want people to, 
to come away from these episodes feeling like a, a, a greater sense of confidence in their painting ability and really ultimately themselves, right? Because when you make a really good painting and you accomplish something like this, it feels really good. Like you're like, wow, I can do this. I'm like, I, I've got this like superpower, right? So that's what I want you to feel like after one of these episodes. So I'm always like, I want to, because sometimes I see in the comments people like, oh, I just like I decided to give up. I'm like, no good. This didn't turn out. And I think like, oh, that's a big bummer for me personally because that's not what the experience I want people to have. So I just realized I wanted a little bit more cold color there. Um. Again, it's a little bit different than the one above, but it doesn't matter. Maybe I'll just put even a little bit... Which one is his... It's hard to know exactly what is a leg of a chair. I think that might be his other leg. So much of this is just shrouded in darkness down there that it. Uh... Anyway, so that's good. Let's let's move on. Let's paint the foreground. Bunch of new people here in the chat. There's uh, B, B, B. Greetings from Amsterdam. Love the class. Thank you, B. Nice to see you. And Ricardo says Van Gogh is the best. You got it. You got it. Uh, I absolutely agree. So what we're gonna do now? What we so we mixed here this cool brown, right? Using cool yellow, cool blue, and cool red, and we saw the type of color that we we got here, right? When we had mostly cool yellow and cool blue, we had a kind of an electric green, and then we added some red to it, and we got this kind of. We started getting a very muddy, darker, less intense brown, and that was perfect for our background. Because, I, I guess I haven't mentioned it in today's episode, but um, one of the, the major principles of, of art is, is um, using warm and cool colors to develop the space, to create depth in your picture. And cool colors recede, they seem to go backwards and behind, and warm colors advance, they come towards the viewer, right? So we want to put our cold colors in the background and the warm colors in the foreground, right? And that will separate the two and give the, the illusion of depth and space in the painting. So along those lines, let's move right in here. Maybe I'll just use a slightly smaller brush. Let's mix a warm brown for our foreground characters, the people, right? So, we're, so let's start out with the warm blue. In fact, I'm, I'll mix it like I did this, but using the warm yellow. Let's take some warm blue now, and we'll see the difference between these two greens. All right, look at that. This green, if anything, we mix the warm yellow and the warm blue, is almost like the the. Um, cool green or cool brown or cool or cool green before we added the red to it right and that's because they're almost the opposite on the color wheel just give me one second here so just this is by the way if you're if you really want more in depth you feel like I'm going too fast explaining this warm and cool process and color mixing I did a whole 45 episode long uh, intro to painting class and the first two or three episodes are all about warm and cool colors color mixing we did the color wheel just like this this is literally what we made in that class uh, there's a link to that in the description below it's called intro to painting or intro to basic acrylic painting i can't remember but it's in the video description below anyway pri what we started with is we mixed our cool yellow and cool blue and we got this really electric green, right? And then we mixed the cool red from across the color wheel. So we took this really nice, bright, saturated green and we mixed it with the red. And what that did is it pulled the color towards the neutral core, towards the gray, 
a muddy middle. Muddy middle. Maybe that's, I like that too. <laughs> the trademark muddy middle. Um, then the then what we just did now is we took the warm yellow, which has got a kind of an orange cast to it. We took that and we mixed it with our warm blue. So they're a little bit, they're further, uh, when that, that color is going right, uh, almost intersecting with the, the muddy middle, the neutral core, right? And therefore, it's already got a kind of brownish, muddy, grayish kind of quality. And then when we add the warm red to it, right, we're pulling it even closer to here. So we'll, just as a, as a uh, heads up there. Okay, <laughs> there's Jazz says Mustachio, and Ufuk Salaritan says hi from Turkey. Hello, I love this very international crowd we have here. This is great. Okay, if you're new to the channel, like and subscribe. Hit that notification bell so that you know when the next episodes are coming. We're doing Van Gogh all week long, tomorrow, the next day, and the next day. And then on Sunday, we're painting a Spider-Man, something totally different. And there's lots of paintings for everyone. Okay, so now let's take some of the warm red here. Put that to the side. And we'll mix this into here. So we're, we've got a brown again, and maybe I put a little, a, a lot, maybe a little bit more red than I put in here. Um, but these these two browns are pretty similar. I'm not going to say that they're radically different, but this one is a little bit warmer. It's got, because we've got warm yellow and warm red in here, particularly, it's going to have just like this orangey quality. And orange is, is what makes a color warm, and green is what makes a color cold or cool, right? So we're going to take this brown, and let's look for place. So we're basically going to paint it almost everywhere in this painting here. And I'll just let's just start here with this. Hmm. I've just just don't want to lose all of these shapes as I'm doing this. Maybe okay. What I'll do, I'm going to paint this with this same color. And I'm just going to modify it as we go here so that we can keep all of these shapes kind of separate. And let's start zooming in here. Now that we're into the foreground area. So, and I'm also going to, as I apply this paint, I'm going to try to go in the shape of these forms. All right, so her skirt, her dress, is kind of draping down here like a bell shape, right? And even though it might be a little bit confusing as to what these, there's going to be a lot of subtlety in this painting, more so than almost any other Van Gogh painting. There's lots of subtlety here. So let's maybe, let's go, we'll add a little bit of warm blue to this. We'll put it off to the side. And I'll just get some of that in here. So I'm just going to be sort of shifting back and forth as I paint the foreground. Just adding maybe a little bit more yellow, maybe a little bit more blue and red. Kind of just into the same muddy brownish mixture just to help me identify one shape from another, right? So here's my little bit of a blue. Keep in mind too, you know, if this is one of the first paintings you're making, then go painted Again, like, I don't know, maybe six or seven versions of this painting because he was not quite happy with uh, the results. 
and he kept building and building, trying to get uh, closer to what he wanted. And we're and and so don't expect that the f that if this is the first time you're making a painting that you're going to solve it right off the bat, right? So here's going to be a little bit more of a greenish color because it took Van Gogh himself, this person we acknowledge as one of the great masters, it took him a while to, to solve this, this puzzle, right? So I'm just going to paint out that face. Oops. Maybe that's a little close. So let's just get a lot more blue on here. I know that there's many different ways that um, to paint, and that my way may be. Uh, some people may like it, and some people might not like it. My my way of painting is just one way that an artist can make a painting. I think this is probably pretty close to how he would have painted himself. Having said that. Um, but there's certainly some people would do this, like literally paint all, like this whole sleeve and get it perfect and then move on to this, you know, her, her, her torso and then paint this arm and get like all of the highlights and everything. Um, personally, I, would, I find that would just take a long time to make this painting. So I'm just gonna now go in here, let's get some red on here, even, well, it doesn't matter, even if it's red, that's cool. Um, I know it's kind of more of a bluish, but you could put blue in there if you like. I think my hope is, is by the end, when we finish this painting, you'll be able to understand the wisdom of this particular kind of method and understand maybe a little bit why an artist like Van Gogh uh, would, would paint in this particular kind of process. Because like the, one of the first things that an artist wants to do is, is just fill the canvas up quickly. Like get, get paint on here, um, especially if you're working from life. Like, it can be, you, you don't want, it's really daunting to have this big, blank, empty canvas staring at you, right? So you want to kind of break up these shapes. I think I'm going to bring this background down a little bit here. So that it meets up with this table. Oops, you can't see what I'm doing, can you? So I was just like, there was this empty space, I'm just going to bring that down. We have this table down there. Um, oh, I just, uh, there's little gaps in the chair. I'll just paint that like this. Okay, that was my cool color. I just threw back into the background because it's still a little bit wet. I'll do the heads and, and headdresses, hats, all that kind of stuff um, later on. I'll sk we'll just sort of, we'll, we'll get... Um, the basics of these, the, the clothing of these figures in. So let's do more with this uh, warm brownish red. Let's let's say let's go. We'll do his body next. Actually, let's paint the chair. This warm brown, like with when in. If possible, it kind of helps to get the color right when you're right off the bat, but it's not necessary. Now you can see I'm using a big brush for all this. I'm not into the weeds, getting really fine details here. I don't really, I'm not, um, not obsessed with detail at this stage of the painting. 
Um, this part of the painting is the painting that I want to get over with as quickly as possible. I just want to fill it up with paint. It's like a quick paint by numbers process. Let's just get all the color in there. And then we can start having fun by getting more specific. And I know when I teach classes in person, I would say the majority of people, this is where what trips them up a lot. They, this is where people want to spend a lot of time and I'm always hovering over them like, okay, I want to see that whole chair painted in the next 20 seconds. Let's go. And they're like, what? 20 seconds? It's going to take me 10 minutes to do that. i got to make sure it's nice and perfect. I'm like, I don't care. I don't want it to be perfect. I want it to be done. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a, um, a task master task master when I'm um, teaching because sometimes people it's like a I tell my students all the time at Emily Carr the university I teach at that um, you know I, I see myself as a little bit like your personal trainer like your fitness trainer and I'm here to like motivate you and, and push you way beyond your boundaries and if you leave this room hating me but you get you're improving and you're getting better and better than my than I'm doing my job. You know, like they say on reality TV shows, I'm not here to make friends. <laughs> so I really want to try to get as much paint onto the surface as quickly as possible. Um, let's go for slightly different color this green so some of this is you know might be a little bit confusing but don't worry as long as you're kind of putting these things into different let's like we're coloring the puzzle pieces slowly it um, you may lose it might start to look like a big glob of just browns and greens and dark blues. But as, if you can at least see some distinct shapes from one another. That's why I'm trying to, to kind of mix a lot more red and then a lot more blue. I and mean, it doesn't matter what of what I put in there. Um, that, I think, is really the goal here. I feel like I'm, I'm a broken record saying these things, but I know that there's, you know, because there's going to be hundreds of people that will watch this. And there's going to be a bunch of people who say, ah, I, oh, I, I got lost. I, um, and I think that's sometimes people putting way too much pressure on themselves. And also, I think people's expectation is that you're going to, the, the painting is going to look great at literally every single stage of the process. Because we're so used to going to a museum and seeing a painting like this on the wall and it in its finished state. We often don't get to go to an artist's studio and see unfinished paintings on the wall. So uh, beginner artists, sort of their expectation is that great art just sort of appears miraculously and uh, it was like finished from the minute the, the first brush strokes were put onto the canvas. And if, it's, if it doesn't look glorious at every single step of the way, well, the, obviously there's something wrong. Some massive error was created along the way, which is absolutely not the case. Uh, where else can we... Let's, I'm going to paint this dark color under here. This is just adding a little bit more warm blue to the same dark color. Same dark brown. Just going back and forth, adding more of one, a little bit more of the other. I probably could be doing painting this whole thing maybe a little bit more extreme uh, colors like this, so you can see the difference. It's like that's pretty clear what's the chair and what's his body. So maybe I'll try to do a little bit more of that going forward. Okay. Now, underneath here, I think let's just mix a little bit more yellow into this mixture. 
just a little bit more of a uh, greenish quality just so you can see the difference between that arm Uh, I'm going to paint the same color on the table here. It's kind of a greenish. Maybe I'll put a little bit more yellow into it. What is on the other side here? We take the. Yeah, let's go right over here. Her, her head. We'll paint that a darker color shortly. Let's paint this fellow here asking for more tea. Crazy that that lens is focusing in and out. It should be. It's on manual focus, and it should just be sitting there doing nothing. But uh, my apologies. Okay. Uh, let's go over here. Let's paint her clothing. Obviously, also this canvas is you know, painting a nine by twelve size canvas. The original is bigger. In fact, let's just take a second because I think we're almost done painting in some of these details. Let's just—I just, just want to see. We can. See the original was uh, eighty-two by one hundred fourteen centimeters, or thirty-two by forty-four inches. So that's a big painting. Thirty-two by forty. I mean, that's. Um, you know, we're talking something like this big, right? And here's the size of our, our painting. So we could probably fit, even let's say this is, we've got this, his nine, so we got nine, 18, basically four of these tall, and then about, f so, what's that, about, you could fit about, my math it was about 16 of these canvases in the same space that you could f so so don't worry about trying to get every detail in it because we're painting at about 1 16th the scale of the original um let's see let's take let's go this dark blue again Oh yeah, her head. Let's get that dark blue here, and then we'll we'll take a we'll step back for a second and just take a look at uh, our results here. Can we do 
do these cups. And then we got this corner of the t this box back here. So we'll just put the same dark blue because she's her we got red there. top red and let's get the chair maybe let's just add a bit more yellow that's good for what we want to do is uh, well let me see should we paint the kettle into let's I'm just gonna mix even more yellow in here sleeve just quickly paint that in a different color so we'll do all the the hands and everything separate even though I personally would do them all right now um, but I just for the sake of to avoid like confusion um, we'll, we'll uh, kind of keep it right here so let's just take a look where we're at at this stage I've been painting for about an hour and this is this is exactly where I would like to to be at this stage in the painting. So let's take a look. Cool. So we've got all of the the, the you know almost all of the painting painted in except faces, hats, and hands, right? Everything else has been covered. Um, I'm even wondering... What I think I might do next is... Actually, I'm going to take my dark color, my, my darkest blue that we just painted, let's say like in the jacket, and I'm going to go around and paint in some details on the faces and the hands so that uh, because I'm gonna do I think I'm gonna paint a skin color and and the for the hats and everything next and I want people to be able to identify where those details actually are um, so so uh, so basically if I paint over top of my pencil lines on the faces right now I'm gonna lose all those details so instead I'm gonna paint them a dark color so that if I paint lighter colors over top, I won't lose those details. This is something I've done in many of the previous paintings we've done before. But uh, again, the vast majority of people who watch this will never have painted with me before, so they won't know. Okay, I'm just going to... I love I mean, already I'm actually really happy with this painting 
right? We're all re we've already got the these dark colors that we see in the original. Yeah, they're not they're not in all the right places. They're you know we've got some you know brown down here where this is going to be darker blue. This is going to be darker blue, and there's going to be greens on here, and this is going to be. And this background here, oh yeah, it's supposed to be green. Why is this now such... To Don't worry about any of that. Don't worry. You want to get your painting to this. So I know that there's going to be some people who maybe, let's say, they painted the chair blue or dark warm blue and some people painted this green or red. It doesn't matter. Does not matter. Because we'll be painting over everything shortly here. And if you think I'm crazy, you can always just skip right to the end. Now, if you're watching me live right now, you could just go have some lunch or take a nap and come back, look at the end, and then you go, oh, actually, you know what? It turned out all right. I was pretty skeptical, but... Uh... And then I'm sure there's going to be somebody like, no, I knew, I knew it was going to be bad from the moment he opened his mouth. <laughs> so uh, there's, always, there's always somebody who's going to feel that way. Um... So let's, uh, as I said, I was going to do the darker lines. Let's take one of our smallest brushes. It doesn't have to be the very smallest brush, but um, I'm going to now take a little bit of maybe more warm blue and just mix this into this color. Remember, all we've been using for the past little while is warm yellow, warm red, warm blue. mix it in with some of these other colors so it's, it doesn't matter you could even just paint warm blue right out of the tube here i just think it'd be nice to it might look a little bit electric if you do that but i think it would work so let's zoom into both of these here right into the details and then Let's start here on the left, just because I'm right-handed, and then I'll work my way over to the right side of the painting. So everything looks mostly dry. I could blow dry this if I wanted, but um, one of the ways that I do this kind of thing, like if I'm painting, I'll often kind of put a finger down like this, just to kind of hold my brush up. And I try to find a place where there's no paint or the paint is dry. That way, um, it gives me just a little more stability. If you're just sort of holding your, your paintbrush over here, then you're more likely to kind of get some lines that you're not happy with. Let's look at the original. Again, so my goal here is not to... paint this whole face in exactly as it looks. You could potentially have just done the entire painting like this, gone over all of your pencil lines with a, a dark line. And that would save you some of, like, trying to find some of the stuff in there. But, uh, mm, I don't know if it would be the best use of your time. Why is that breathing like that? Huh. That's strange. Yeah, let's keep on going.
Right now she looks like she's yelling at him. We'll refine all these details. Don't worry. I just want to be able to know where's the nose? Where's the where's all those little details? So here's our hand. Right, like again, don't labor over all of this here. We've got one, two, three, four fingers. Sometimes I, I need to count because otherwise I end up with like Disney characters who've got, uh, we're missing a, a couple of digits. You know what's you know the one of the ironies is that you know Van Gogh worked on this painting. He saw this painting as like his chance to uh, get into the salons to to impress people, and then to like eventually, you know, he figured if I just make one really good painting, that will kind of cement my position as a as an important artist in the community. And I'll be able to um, uh, uh, you know make a living as an artist. I'll be a professional artist. Unfortunately, and, and he he really worked hard on trying to improve his uh, figure drawing abilities. He wasn't he was never a very good uh, like uh, figurative well, he, he did lots of great portraits, but he was never really good at painting like full length. Uh, images of people they always had a bit of an awkward quality and this is really this is the only painting that I know of in which he painted multiple people in the same painting together I think every other painting he did was just one person and and now that I'm thinking about this we've only done a few paintings that have more than one person like we did one with the Jacob Lawrence baseball player um, where there's you know the batter and the, the catcher and umpire and the crowd. I don't know. You tell me if you can think of another one where we had a bunch of people in it. Um, so the so he worked on this thinking this would be, uh, you know, his breakthrough painting, and it didn't have that effect at all. People were not impressed with his figures. That they generally thought his figures were really awkward and clumsy. And so you can imagine how kind of upsetting and embarrassing that would be if you thought like, "Man, this is my my big hit." You know, it's sort of like people who go on American Idol and they're like. I'm going to be, this is my one shot, I'm going to come on here, I'm going to blow them away, everyone's going to be so excited, they're just, they, they're just probably just going to give me the, the, the championship prize right there, because they're just going to be like, no one's going to be able to compete with this amazing singer, and then they walk out on the stage, and they're like, ah, 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 and the judges are like, oh, horrified, it's almost a little bit like what the reaction to this painting was when Van Gogh tried to have it exhibited. People are like, uh, this is your best painting. Um, okay. Have you s seen any other paintings before? Because the kind of painting that's out these days is like really well painted, super realistic figures. There were other people that painted very similar scenes t like to this. And so Van Gogh was met with rejection. And that would have been just crushing. But as, like a lot of artists, um, he didn't give up, right? A, a lot of artists, you know, just, you, I think part of being an artist is, is there's, you, you have like, 
uh, you almost have to be a little bit crazy because you just have to oh yeah these people don't know what they're talking about no and this is actually a great painting um, I'll prove them wrong and so that's sort of like what he did he was just like well these people just don't appreciate good art they don't know what good art is they've never really seen it so I just have to keep doing my thing and people will eventually come around good thing can you imagine if van gogh had given up at this stage like imagine how different like the whole uh, trajectory of of art would have been if he had said well i guess they have a point i'm not really that good i guess i really should just give up um wow and and you know what the 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 sad thing is is that happens all the time that happens to artists all the time and think about how many great artists the world has been deprived of because whoa, it's my ice <laughs> flew down from above here we've got water on the canvas if you're quick and you can wipe that off that's your ideal thing so you don't get water because once that water gets on the canvas it will start to dissolve the paint so not a big deal I, obviously scared me but might have been scary for people listening whoa that's a loud sound oops and little bits of water on there that's because it's quite uh hot in the studio here so i got the fan blowing here you probably hear that kind of drone sound in the background that's what that is like of course I get this really great microphone right at the beginning of of summer so it picks up all the sounds uh, so in a few months when things are really cold in here and I'm wearing long johns and my my warm winter boots um, I won't have to deal with ice packs anymore I'll, but then I'll have my space heater here blowing air, uh, hot air on my legs okay so if you were if you wanted to take a break this would be a great time to take a break if you were um, planning on painting finishing it in oil paint this would be a great time to to let this dry and switch to oil paint because that's there's a lot of artists begin a painting with acrylic get it to this stage and then put the acrylics away wash up all the brushes and then switch to oil paint to finish the painting um, so because really what we've done here it it might some people might be really really happy with this painting at this stage most artists would consider this a, 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 a uh, underpainting which is what we've just accomplished here right so we've got our underpainting you know I ideally would be painting the faces and hands and stuff but this would be a, probably a pretty good place to make that transition um, or if you want to take you know stop for the day and then come back and watch this video the, the second half of the video that would also work as well uh, but I've you know for about an hour and a half of painting is where we are right here especially the complexity in this painting that would be really great that this would be a, a, a you should feel really happy with yourself if you're anywhere near this in your own painting right now and uh, you know the other thing too is I'm, I take I'm taking my time I, tr I, I hear feedback from some people say I go too slow and then I hear people say I go too fast so I don't know I think somewhere I'm if I'm if I hear that then that sounds pretty then I'm kind of going down the middle and maybe 
the majority of people like the speed that I go. So, what should we do next here? I think, uh... That looks like it's mostly dry. So, let's now, I think we'll paint the... The light, we'll paint these faces and hands in. And then, and then that would really be a great place to, to really end if you want to get there. Um, and that'll take us maybe another 15 minutes to get to that place. Okay, so the next step we're going to do, let's just mix a quick little flesh tone, it's just a, a basic version, um, although it's not really that much different to do a more complex version. Let's take some warm yellow, a little bit of warm red, and you can see how I, like, I build these up, I, I kind of put my colors together like this, and then I can then go in and start blending things up a little bit. And then if I need more of one color or another, I can just add a little bit more of it. Okay, so that's a very warm reddish brown, right? It's the same combination of colors that we made this here, but you can see when we add much less blue what the results are, right? Let's take a bit more yellow. Lighten that up even more. Okay. Now let's take a little bit of white. Now we don't need too much of it. I think that's probably pretty good. Somewhere in here. The one, th the one reason I don't want to put too much white, not only because it'll it'll get really too bright too quickly, but also I'm going to paint over a lot of these lines that I put down there. And if I put white in there, it's just going to cover up all that work I just did. So let's zoom in again. And how about let's start... So has anyone ever been to Amsterdam? Has anyone ever visited uh, some of the locations that Van Gogh painted in, uh, such as southern France, Provence, or outside, just outside of Paris? Anyone been to Arles? Um, or uh, was it Saint-Rémy? Oops. Uh, Saint-Rémy-sur something I can't remember be curious to know if anyone's ever visited some of those locations either just to see this the Van Gogh sites or if they uh, just happened to have visited those places and and found out later on that they were where they were um, it's always kind of interesting to hear because I've got lots of stories that I can tell over the next few days. I just put a little bit right there in the face of this child. I probably should have left a bit of that without painting on it, but you know that's where some of the the uh, the light is hitting the side of her face. We'll probably just do that with some white anyway. So I forgot this sleeve, so it's still a little bit, still some wet paint on here. So let's do. Paint 
pointing in. Any little areas that I just somehow missed. Um, I don't know why I painted that. That's so dark. Such a dark blue, but eh, doesn't matter. Because um, it's going to go almost the exact opposite. I, maybe I'm just going to take some of that paint off because it's so wet. I just care about filling up this painting. Okay, let's go to the light next. Uh, I, don't, I was going to wash my brush. I don't even need to wash that brush. Let's get some white. And let's, we'll just take some of this color that we had there before so that we're making it not bright, bright white. We want to reserve that to the very end. We just got kind of slightly off-white color here that we can use to paint in some of these hats. This right in where the lamp is. Now this lamp is somewhere like in here. If you've lost that, just think about like, well, I guess I painted it much further down than, yeah, it doesn't matter. Maybe my lamp. Something like that. Again, all of this is kind of infinitely customizable. Just brightening up the side of her face there. We'll brighten up a bunch of that. Let's go to her. So B says, I went to Van Gogh, to the Van Gogh Museum last week. So, so satisfying to be painting these paintings now. That is so cool. <laughs> I'm so jealous that you're just down the road from the Van Gogh Museum and the Rijks Museum. Oh my goodness. Those are like some of the best museums in the whole world. Um, can't wait until the world opens back up again and we can do some traveling and uh, our family uh, was supposed to go on a big epic trip to Europe last summer in 2020 uh, I was doing supposed to do a residence art residence in the southern France kind of near um, I think it was near, was it Nice? I think that's where we were going to be. Um, and then I was going to do, or I was going to do once in Florence for a month. We were going to stay in this castle and and um, I was so excited. Uh, it, yeah, a month in a castle in Florence and then a month in this uh, small town. Where was it? So, somewhere near Nice. It seems like it seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? <laughs> like last summer. Of course, that didn't end up happening. You know, Italy at the time uh, we were supposed to be there was like the the, the hardest hit place of of all. Um, so. I hope that the the people we were going to be who who own that residence are doing well. I'd love to go back out there. So um, I've been to Amsterdam twice. If you've never, just for people, obviously B, who's in Amsterdam right now, knows very well how great of a city Amsterdam is. Um, 
If you've never been to Amsterdam, it's definitely a place you should put on your bucket list. Not only to go see the Van Gogh Museum and the Rijksmuseum. The Rijksmuseum is like the the history art museum. It's sort of like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is in New York. It's like the or the Tate Gallery in London, England. Uh, it's like their version of it in Amsterdam. And it's got all the, like, some of the most famous Rembrandt paintings in the world. It's got some Van Goghs and lots of other paintings. But I, the ones that, when I've, if I've gone there, I've gone right to the Rembrandt areas. Because those are the ones you see in all the textbooks and stuff. Um, but the other thing I was going to say about Amsterdam is what a beautiful city. You know, um, my... It, my when I was much younger, I went backpacking around Europe the first time in too long ago for me to even tell you what date that was. But um, I was really Amsterdam was was really the first place in Europe I had visited on on my own with a good friend of mine. Him and I backpacking around, and I was just struck by how beautiful of a town it was. Like all the I didn't expect there to be canals and. Uh, little boats all over the place and people living on boats uh, a lot in, in a way a lot like Venice, Italy I know some of you are like, what? Venice is nowhere or Amsterdam is not like, but you know if you've, you know what I mean um, just a gorgeous town, I didn't imagine it to be there, to be like that um, so you're very lucky to be, to be in a great place like that Ricardo says, more paintings of Van Gogh <laughs> okay Ricardo I'm, uh <laughs> we'll, we'll, we've got three more. I'll also let you know that in uh, January, I'm going to be starting the whole Intro to Painting course over again, either on a Tuesday or Thursday, I'm not sure, and we'll kind of start some of the most basic... I think we're going to do all new paintings so we can get um, some fresh... Uh, start over for, for, for people that are, are starting over from the beginning and kind of so I can update some of the things that I've been... You know, things I've learned over the past year of live streaming all the time. Uh, hopefully some of the technical difficulties have been ironed out. So we'll start that over. And then I'm also going to do, keep this main, the Master Study series, but I want to do paint, like all of the most expensive paintings uh, ever. So we'll be painting, uh, there'll be a few Van Gogh paintings that you might be like, why didn't we, why aren't we painting that, da, 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 Portrait of Dr. Gachet, that's... Ah, stay tuned for January when we when we cover paintings like that and the Leonardo Salvador Mundi and um, etc. Um, so so this is great. I'm really happy with where I am at this stage. Maybe I didn't need to paint that white. Uh, one little thing: if we're painting white onto places, you'll see that when we start adding other colors over top, white is such a bright color that it's going to want to push through any of the darkness. So, just it's white is such a strong color that it will kind of constantly rise back through the surface. It's like this zombie color that is always like rising hands out of the grave right so um sometimes as you get more experience painting it's just something to be a little bit mindful of i think a lot of people use a lot more white in their painting i think there's always, some people use way too much white and then there's some people who need to add a lot more white and don't use white at all okay where should we? I think we will go back to the background now. My goal would be for the, in the next 45 minutes is to just rock out on the background, finish it off as as much as possible, so that we can spend the remaining part of the episode working on all these figures in the um, foreground. So. Now we want to try to get a little bit closer to some of these colors. So basically we can just, remember we mixed, this was our cold colors that we had mixed earlier. We're just going to go back and sort of do what we did earlier with the warm colors, or we just finished doing with the warm colors in the foreground. And now we can be a little bit more selective of, is it going to be green or is it going to be brown? Is it going to be a little bit bluer? We'll, we'll make all those decisions at right now 
So let's get a little bit more paint on the palette. Uh, Paula says in the chat, yes, I was in Amsterdam in my young age, a beautiful city. I walked across the long bridge a couple of times. Um, yeah, that's that's one. I, I would love to go back to Amsterdam with her, her young daughter. I think it would be such a beautiful city to walk around. Um, okay. So maybe I'm going to zoom out on this. We're going to be focusing on the backgrounds. I don't think we need to get too close into some of these details. A lot of this is quite dark. In fact, what I did is I brightened up this image so that we could see some of these details. But really, if I go, come on, open up. If you were to see this painting in person, on the wall, it kind of looks a lot like this. <laughs> or let's say, Come on. You know, that's kind of like what the painting looks like. So a lot of these details that are up here, all of that just sort of kind of just looks black, right? You can think of all this down here. It's not until, um, Uh, if you look at the painting for an extended period of time where it starts to brighten up when we see things in the shadows, which is really the way a painting should behave. It should sort of reveal itself to you as you look at it. Anyway, let's take some um, cool yellow, cool blue, and start kind of dialing in some of these darker areas. So again, that's too bright to really paint anywhere, so we're going to modify it with a little bit of red. And we get back to this kind of um, dark green. And I think we're going to need a lot more red. We're going to turn this, get it a little bit more brown. Now one thing I'll do is I kind of like leaving some different colors here. I like to kind of mix so I'd, rather than having to, like I kind of pre-mix a little bit here so I can just kind of d dabble a little bit of this, go back and dabble a little bit of that, and move back and forth, and maybe even do one where we're having a little bit more of a purpley quality. So a little bit of variety here. Uh, oh, that's maybe a little bit too purple, but we'll see. So, get all this excess off. I'm going to switch to a smaller brush now. One of the things we don't see in this painting is Van Gogh's signature. Uh, style yet. He doesn't quite, you know, you don't have those, the dashes of things that we see and swirls that are in um, the the Starry Night painting, most famously, for instance. So he's still figuring it out, but we do see some like, pretty strong marks, let's say on the clothing and the folds, etc. So where should we begin here? I think I want to start identifying some of the structure so I'm going to take this dark kind of purpley color I'm just going to paint this onto that beam there we've got it's a little confusing as to exactly what is going on in parts of the of this painting and I think he may have even just been like, you know what, I'm not even sure. I've maybe lost the plot a little bit, so I'm just going to darken some of this and make it really dark. People won't know <laughs> what's happening. I'll be able to get away with a little bit. Which is, you know, not totally uncommon. Artists sometimes 
get a little bit lost in some of the details and just like, ah, I'm just going to hide this in a shadow and it'll just sort of look like there's a bunch of stuff here. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking really this very dark purple brown and I'm just going to kind of paint in some of this. Your guess is as good as mine as to what we are seeing. I think, I think it's like pots and pans that are hanging up in here. Um, and maybe this is the direction of the ceiling. So I'm just going to paint that in there. And just build this out here. Come down. Likewise, maybe I'll get a little bit more green on my brush. I'm just going to do this area in here. I think there's... This clock shape here. And then I just sort of turn this into a bit of a dry brush and just sort of blend it out into this area. All right? Yesterday when we did the Attila Richard Lukacs painting for Vancouver Pride, we did a lot of uh, dry brush in the background. I'm going to take this same color, actually, the same dark color I just put up here, and I'm going to put this down here. I think I'm going to need a little bit more purple in it. Start just darkening up in here. So it looks like he's almost like outlining some of these shapes. He may have done a little bit of what I'm doing. He may have done this a little bit later on. But I think just for our purpose, we'll just take care of it right now. Um, you know what? I'm even going to just do this down here as well. Like, I think this area underneath the chair, all of this, like the chair legs, we may even just glaze some dark color even over top of this so it just becomes almost completely pitch black and I can imagine some people saying like why even bother um, putting in that kind of detail when you're just going to darken it anyway um, it's because just like I was saying with the, the this painting is it's really even if it's really dark it doesn't mean we're just gonna like have big solid black areas of complete darkness what's really satisfying for viewers to, is to stand in front of a painting and for parts of it just to kind of start revealing themselves to you 
Like, that, I think, is so cool. If you're... Is to be... It, we just... We have such a different experience now of looking at paintings. Um... Like, because we're used to seeing pictures and magazines and stuff, and, and they're really well lit when they're photographed. But traditionally, like, paintings, you know, might be seen in natural light, and they might be quite dark. And you might live with a painting for years. And just like you when you read a, a novel the second or third time, you're like, oh, or, or you watch a movie the second time, decades later, and you're like, oh, wow, I, to I didn't even notice that the bad guy was in the grocery store in the background. That's so interesting. Ah, you know, like you start seeing details you didn't even, you just thought were sloppy parts of the film or something, right? Um... Okay. I think I'm just going to... Let's get a bit more green on here. So this bean... Let's get a little bit more of that same green. And then maybe I'll paint this like a brown, a really dark brown, I guess. I, I mean, we are kind of using brown, but it, we don't have enough white or yellow in there. So let's do that now. Let's take this yellow. Let's mix it in here. Get a little bit more red. Okay. I'm not sure how well that shows up on camera, but we've got a brown. And now I'm going to paint this brown. Maybe even I'll just paint um, Yeah, I'll paint I'll, I'll get a little more detail in those. Okay. Paint that brown. Let's now go here. Keep on building all of these shapes out. Um, let's do this brown as well. frame of this painting in. Uh, let's get the clock. Okay. How 
we doing here? Um, I think what I'll do here is we got like these slats in this roof. bit undecided about how much more I want to do with the background at this stage. Um, part of me thinks what we should do is just move on to the foreground figures. Even though there's lots of detail back here, I'm just thinking about time. Uh, because, I mean, there there is lots of little things in here, but I think we could do some of this as glazes, and we could do that pretty quick, because we're going to darken a lot of this, and maybe a lot of that won't be so important anyway, I think, maybe, I'm just going to take a bit of more yellow, and we'll mix it in here. small brush and let's zoom in Take a bit of white and mix it into this color. along here. Do a little bit more of that. I kind of like. I said I was going to move on, then here I am, like da -da -da, fiddling, fiddling in the background, fiddling. So I'm just going to spend maybe five quick minutes just doing a little bit of work here. And you can see I'm not doing anything too precise. I'm not really concerned about that at all. Uh, we'll brighten. I'm not even going to do any of this work on the, the, the 
lantern yet. That'll be for a little bit further down the road. That might even be one of the f closer to the final things that I do in this painting. This is actually, what he's done here is really nice. I'm doing a pretty sloppy, quick version of it. But as I'm just looking at him like that, there's a really nice kind of attention to detail that he's, he's focusing on. And the way the light is hitting that cabinet back there, or doorway, or window, I'm not sure what, it, what that is. Um, I'm just going to take just a couple seconds here to... Put a little so what I have here is this is my uh, brown cold brown and then we've got um, maybe I should, I'll do part of this it's a darker color and I have two brushes here let's take this let's make some dark shapes of just a few spoons and things in here. So these are just, I'm not sure what these shapes are. As I said, I think they're pots and pans. Can't quite tell, so I'm just going to put a little bit of you know, fake shapes and stuff back there. And when we darken it even more, it'll sort of disappear. We'll look up, see all these like, weird little highlights. I think that's good enough. Um... What else? Maybe that does the clock need any extra love here? Okay, I think it's time to move on from the background. As much, uh, we'll, we'll darken a few things in, but I, you know, my the way that I like to work is I don't want to finish everything completely because I might need to lighten something up. I might need to darken something up, and there's not enough of the painting done yet for me to really know exactly what needs to be brightened and darkened so I don't want to commit myself completely to that uh, to doing that just yet keeping my brushes as clean as possible remember I haven't used any water except for you know that very first yellow layer that we put down on here okay so now let's do the, what should we do? Maybe we should do the faces next. I think that might be satisfying for some people because that might be the, the part that people struggle with. So maybe we should do that now before people get too tired. So um, let's, let's, uh, 
let's mix. So we've let's well let's mix a little bit more of this skin tone. Let's zoom out a bit. So we've got some here, but I'm gonna mix a little bit more just so we have it ready. It's ticking. Probably use most of that. So warm yellow, warm red, warm blue to make up skin tone and make a brown. Now that's that's pretty good. It's a little bit it, obviously it's it's way too bright for this. So we're going to keep this color here. We can add uh, let's take a big scoop of white. We'll just keep that next to it so we can brighten things up. Um, I'm just going to wipe that white off my brush. And then um, let's mix some more of these dark browns over here. So it's the same sort of thing. In fact, we'll get a little bit more warm yellow. Because what we're going to do is, is have this warm browns that we use to paint the foreground figures. And we can add that color to our flesh tones to modify how bright or dark they need to be, right? So let's take this warm yellow, warm blue. We can put much more of it here and warm red. I think that's pretty good. So now we've got a really nice dark brown. I think we even want a little, uh, want to make a dark, or in, a much darker brown even, um, that we can use for some shadows. So let's take some of this dark blue. Let's, I'm just going to mix a separate kind of color right here. this in a lot of places. In fact, let's do a th third one that is mostly blue. There we go. So now we've got lots of options. And I like to have, especially when I'm dialing into faces, or especially in the way that Van Gogh painted, right now I've got a kind of a, a, a fairly darker skin tone, like local colors. Uh, and then we, we're going to brighten it up We've, if we want to make highlights. So we got our white right there. We've also got this kind of nice brown that we're going to use a lot of. We've got a, a darker version of that same brown, and then we've got one that's mostly just like a dark blue. All right, so we've sort of got all the... These are all of the ranges of colors that we need to complete... Not even just the faces, but really most of the bodies and clothing, uh, chairs and everything else in the foreground of the picture. And if you were to look at Vincent van Gogh's palette, it would look a lot like what we see right here. Like he would not have had these bright, cool blues, the bright, cool yellow, um, this bright, warm red. His palette, even like right out of the tube, would have would have not been too much brighter than what we see right here, which I think is just kind of interesting because um, the very just these colors just did not exist, or the, or they may have existed, but it would have been outrageously expensive, like prohibitively expensive. It's really interesting to think about that. There, in the history of color, there were certain colors that were just out of the price range of a lot of artists. Now you can go to the art supply store, and yeah, maybe, you know, there's sometimes you might find a tube of paint that is, you know, like, oh, this one is $12, and this one is maybe $17. And you're like, wow, that's so much more expensive. Like, one is Series 1 and one Series 4 or something. Um... And there might be one that's $25, and one's $12, one's 
but can you imagine the difference between like okay you can buy all your your uh reds and browns and yellows um and maybe one blue all of those are going to be twelve dollars but can you imagine uh like a a, a, a yellow like this being two thousand dollars right and so you would instead of buying a whole tube of it you've got this little tiny bottle that you break out for very small details little bits here and there right for a purple purple um you could kind of mix it with the colors that they had but to get an actual like purple that could have cost maybe uh you know uh, let's say ten thousand dollars per brush stroke right which is why it was it's a royal color which would have been very seldomly used so you imagine like wow okay i gotta make sure i know exactly what i want to do with that color before i put it onto the canvas it's got paint all over it sometimes i accidentally put my wet paint brushes next to my clean paint brushes and then Paint starts getting everywhere. Okay, I love where everything is. I can imagine some people not being super happy with their paintings if they're looking at it like this right now. I mean, like, hmm, I don't know. You gotta trust the process, as Marcus Lemonis likes to say. Anyone, anyone out there like watching? What is that show? My wife and I used to watch it all the time. I... <laughs> Um. Anyway, I can't. Uh, can't remember what it is. Marcus Lemonis, reality TV show, MSNBC. Goes around, saves failing businesses. Anyway. <laughs> um. Okay, let's make. Let's start here on the left. Let's even zoom in on this figure. And we'll zoom in on this. And now I'm looking at it. Wow, it is. That's a dark painting. Uh, wow, we are probably mostly going to be using some of these dark colors and maybe actually a lot more green than I was expecting. So let's. I think I'm going to mix a green separately. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, sort of. You know, when you get up close to some of these paintings, you start looking at them and you see things a little bit differently. So I think we'll use a green also to modify things. Let's take this white, or yellow, sorry. I'm going to add some white to it. So it might not be that much flesh tone now that I... But so we can use this for highlights. This is just warm yellow and white, right? Let's, we'll, let's start out with some flesh tones as if we're just painting any other face. Hmm. We're going to go pretty much right into our darker brown. It's not... It's just, you know, one of the things that Van Gogh is, is really well known for is high contrasts between different colors, right? And that's how you get these really bright, um, his, these kind of those lines that he's really famous for. Um, he's used, he is kind of, he, he was interested in color theory and he, um, uh, one of the, the, the color theories at the time was this idea of opposing bright uh, or opposite colors from one another like that are on the opposite sides of the color wheel like a um, uh, brown or sorry a, a red with blue or yellow with purple so I'm just going in darkening some of this because I got so much on my brush this is just a dark purple color I might even make that bl more blue shortly Man, 
this is really interesting. Now that I'm diving in and looking at this, here's some green. I think his palette at this, I think he's, his colors, I bet you, are super muddy when he's painting this. It's almost a little bit too green on there, so. Again, this face probably took up most of the canvas that I'm painting on right now. So just be mindful if you're like, oh my goodness, so much detail. It's not so much that you get the all of the details in here. These, This is my warm yellow and white and probably a little bit of green from my paintbrush. It's driving me crazy that that lens keeps focusing and unfocusing. I never noticed that before. gonna drive me absolutely bonkers. So I'm sort of going back and forth. Use you can see there's that purple, and then I've added some of this uh, yellow, and then I'm gonna add a little bits of, of green as I go over top and mix into some of this. I mean, these are tiny little details here, so you're gonna, we're just going to do the best we can given the, the scale we're working at. I might even like do a greenish glaze over some of this here later on. This is definitely mine is is a lot more purpley at the moment but as I um, I would just sort of remind people just to keep on moving forward even if you're not really happy with the the color mixture that you've got going Because painting is, is like a process, and we're trying to decode this paint. We're kind of working our way backwards a little bit, trying to figure out exactly the, the, the process and strategies that he used 
to get here. So I'm actually quite happy with the way this looks at this exact moment here. Okay, I'm going to take some white and mix this into this green and yellow. a bit almost a, in that highlight actually a bit of of um, like these this around the collar you can see that's a cold blue right there that's a teal so I think he's got some cold blues in here we'll get all that I think later on I'm just gonna keep on moving forward with my warm colors first we can even if glaze like even if you get the colors wrong right now what's so fun about doing a glaze is we can just paint this in whatever colors we want put a green glaze over all this and then boom colors colors magically right <laughs> And if you've never done a glaze or anything before, we'll, we'll, I'll show you how to do all of that. Um, I think I do need to just keep getting, make this much more greenish. Greenish, yellowy, mustardy. So I can see the beginnings of his trademark style kind of happening, even just right in here on the table. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Let's uh let's keep powering forward here. Should we do her face and body? Yeah, let's just keep on going. Uh, even though his, his body's not done, I just want to Let's see, take some of this flesh tone.
Okay, let's get a bit of this right color. Okay, get some green on here. Oops, big, too big gob of it. This is my warm blue, or dark warm blue. Okay, kind of going back into some of these brownish colors. That was a little too severe. Okay, my dark brown. Let's get uh, some of these greens on here again. I'm actually really quite impressed by his use of color in this painting. This is, there's some tricky things going on in here that it's not. Um, yeah, it's a lot of the way that he's using these these browns and greens is definitely challenging. 
We'll make it work. This is gonna just takes a little bit of patience. You wonder it, what is going on in this painting. It's almost like the the narrative, that he, the story that he's trying to tell here. Has this guy just said something? Like he just got fired from his job, and the, this is the wife looking at him. Like, are you kidding me? What are we gonna do? Like, you moron. <laughs> um. So let's go into some darker colors. It's darker blue. Still quite wet there, that's all right. Leave under here. We'll take care of that again on its own. Well, it's very muddy. Like I totally, I can understand why some people might have difficulties with something like this, but just have to keep on going. Just painting little details that you see. They don't have to be right or perfect. Okay, I think I'm just gonna move on from some of this and we'll come back and we'll, we'll keep on learning. Let's see, so this face here, let's put in these bright highlights, I forgot some of those hands. Because again, this is warm yellow with white. Basically, that's all that's in there. So I'm going to take now this dark blue. This part of the painting should be probably one of the darkest parts of the entire picture back of this girl's head right because if the if this is the only light source coming from there then and she's sort of standing in front of it it's going to obscure most of the light right I'm just gonna jump up to a larger brush and I need more warm blue
just want to get some of these the kind of the folds in this fabric very quickly Okay, let's keep on moving. Um, Paula asks, did uh, Vincent Van Gogh attend art school? Uh, not that I know of. Um, I don't think so. I think he was mostly a self-taught artist. He probably, he, he did, um, he was friends with a number of artists, like Paul Gauguin being the most famous, who kind of nurtured him and, and showed him some kind of important lessons. Uh, Vincent van Gogh's brother, Theo, or Theo, or Theo is probably closer to the actual original pronunciation um, in Dutch, but... Um, Although it's spelt like Theo here in Eng in English, but um, um, Theo was was a was a, a very well known art dealer in uh, Holland, and um, and through his brother, he he would have been that's how he was introduced to a lot of the big art at the time is that his brother was exhibiting it, selling it to clients, and literally, in, like, inter not only just introduced him to their art, but introduced to the, him to the, to the people, him, the, the actual artists. So, he... Because um, uh, his, his brother was his biggest fan. His brother realized that Van Gogh was just there's he just was not going to be a uh, a regular fellow who would go to a nine to five job like he did and did his very best to support him financially um, socially by introducing him to people but Van Gogh was a, like a, a a hard to be around kind of guy. He burnt a lot of bridges with people. He would get in angry arguments. He probably drank too much. Like, it's... You know, he's... I don't know if he was around today. If... If he would have... Uh, you know, I don't... I think some people might not have wanted... You know, I'm trying to think of who, what kind of celebrity would he be if he was alive today. Um, like he was almost like had a manic personality. Like a, he would, you know, Gauguin, who he became very good close friends with, and famously cut his ear off. And we'll talk about that in a future episode. Uh, he he cut his ear off shortly after. A big argument with uh, Gauguin. Um, um, why did I bring up Gauguin? Good question, Michael. Uh, it's like paint, painting and talking at the same time can be a, a little bit tricky if it. Uh, Sometimes I'm like, I lose my train of thought, obviously. Oh, did he attend art school? Um, that's right. Um, so even though he didn't go to art school, he was surrounded by people that had gone to art school, were exhibiting artists, were professionals. And he he painted with them on occasion. And you know, 
going to art school back I mean there were really there was academies uh, the painting academy like the Royal Academy of Art where I also went to school in, in London, England there was the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in, in Paris um, and those would teach like very very traditional painting techniques some of which we've, we've covered in, in our episodes um, here's some dark brown my dark green But he was, you know, another myth about Van Gogh is that he was just this like wild beast of a person he he did have a temper and he did get in arguments and burn bridges but he was also a very articulate person very well read um his his letters are evidence of that if you've um they uh, his brother teo his his wife so Van G teo died very shortly after um, Van Gogh, and they're buried side by side in this, in which in I visited their uh, the, the cemetery and graves. Luckily, uh, Teo's wife, without without her, she's sort of like the un uh, uh, the unsung hero of the whole Van Gogh mythology. She's the one that that sort of rescued. Uh, Van Gogh really from obscurity and maybe a little bit out of necessity you know when her husband who is the main breadwinner or the only breadwinner if you think about like culture back then when he died she was like oh my goodness what do you do so and she's got this huge collection of, of her um, step what would you call it or brother, brother-in-law brother-in-law's artwork kind of sitting around the house and it's like how do I how do I feed the family so she was smart enough to be able to turn that around and sell her her stepbrother or her brother-in-law's art to feed the family uh, again some of these colors are off don't worry about it we'll just keep on plowing ahead Let's tackle this tea kettle here. So, you know, one of the things that's happening right now is I'm just going around all of these different shapes, starting to define them a little bit more. I'm not again, I'm not really concerned at all with with. Um, accuracy color accuracy I'm mostly interested in just light and dark areas and then as as I go once I've sort of got cl 
closer into these shapes, I can then get focus my time on on uh, getting closer to the actual original colors. But there's no real point in doing that at this stage. This definitely starts to feel like very Van Gogh-ish. Like when we start painting his bedroom tomorrow, I think you'll see, you know, the, quite a development from where he is here into the to that painting and beyond. just almost pure ultramarine blue, warm blue. really dark ultramarine blue it's got a bit of some other colors in it just to darken it down but for the most part it's very dark The other thing you, you can start to see with the way that he's applying paint is the paint is getting thicker and, and more decisive sort of marks, like kind of like that I'm putting down here. It's almost interesting, like you see, like as we go from left to right on this painting, his style is, is almost developing bet before our eyes here. And part of that, you know, you can... It's almost like if, if you're painting this painting along with me right now, you start to kind of feel a little bit, uh, you know, impatient. And you're just like, ah, let's just get this painting done as quickly as possible. And it's it's part of his style can almost be is an outgrowth of just impatience, of just like, ah, let's just put some color in here be done with it. Because there's, there's an incredible boldness with his application of paint that is um, almost unlike any other artist before him or since. Come 
up here. Um, and we'll take care of this face. Maybe a little bit higher. Not that high. <laughs> And so this is just warm blue. I've been using this a lot, like warm blue, with some, that's kind of mixed in with some of the, the red and yellow, warm, warm, all warm colors. Just getting lots of paint in and on the canvas as quickly as possible here. You gotta be kind of bold and decisive. There's gonna be colors just like as I'm painting here, and they, they mix and they go gray and turn into blobs and it's can drive you absolutely nuts don't give up Okay, let's go down to that hand. Okay, so we're going to zoom out here in a second and just take another little look and, and see where we're at and kind of um, check in. Uh, yeah, let's do that right now. Okay. So I'm, I feel really good about this painting. 
I know some people probably look at it and are like, what? It looks, you know, the colors are wrong. Something's, something's wrong with this painting. I don't feel that way at all, but I also have a lot of experience painting. So when I, I, I'm not troubled by any of those, those things. Cause this is also every painting. It's a process. You always have to think about like, we're so used to seeing the painting when it's all completed without any mistakes or artists has fixed everything. We don't see the painting in this point of time. I, I, I would be, I, I bet you this painting looked like this at, at one stage. Maybe the colors weren't exactly the way I have it here, but I think it was probably pretty close, pretty darn close to what I see right here. Um, and then, I, you know, I would say, you know, we're I've been painting for about two and a half hours or so. Um, there's always a bit, <laughs> a lot of talking at the beginning. Um, so you just have to to as the and it comes with experience is just knowing that you're still working on it right it's just it's like tasting you know somebody's cooking in the kitchen and you open up the oven and you take a bite you're like oh this fish is gross it's still raw and the chef would be like Get out of my kitchen. Of course it's raw. It's not finished. Get out of here. Go, like... <laughs> so you have to kind of think, like, okay, well, it's not finished. So, of course, it's not going to be... I'm not going to be super happy with it yet. And I, and I also really like that, you know, a lot of it is, is quite well developed. I mean, really, the main thing I'm thinking about at this point is... I feel like I've got 85% of the background done, and I think I've got maybe 30% of the foreground done. So what we're going to be doing next is I'm just going to kind of go back over the painting. We're going to continue working on details over here, and then I think by the time we get over here, the painting is going to look very different in probably about another 45 minutes from now. And at that point, we're going to be work. I'll, I'll do the light a little bit in the backgrounds and maybe a little bit of glazing, like a light, um, probably a, a cold gray or cold green, and a like a almost like a wash. You could just go over the whole painting, but I'll probably be a little more selective than that, and things would change because I see he's obviously gone back into the painting I'll just show you places where he's clearly gone in probably some of the final brush strokes I would say he did might have been due to this light and and using some of that same color this here is is clearly some some stuff to brighten up this face which might have got a little bit too dark it might have been really weird with that shape in the foreground like that I also see a lot of this. You can see, look at there's a lot of white in this this greenish um, blue color, and it also looks like a bit of, as I said earlier, a cold cold green that he's applying over a lot of this. So I bet you most of the painting had these um, browns and yellows, and it was much more of a brown painting. Why it's gone green is is a interesting question. It is possible that he painted a lot of green over top of it. It's also very possible that it is the varnish that he or somebody else applied to the painting afterwards. We've never really talked about varnishing, but varnishing is essentially like you've we've probably heard of varnishing your patio or your deck or your or your kitchen table and you and you you put on like a, a, a coat on top of the wood to protect it from stains and scratches and and the weather right especially if things are outside and artists use a varnish as well to seal in the paint so that you know if you put this if you make a painting and it's in your kitchen or it's in your bathroom or next to your dinner table and if I was to take this painting right now and, and set it up 
and our daughter was to spray some you know breakfast all over it and I tried to I took a wet cloth and tried to wipe it off I would wipe off most of this painting and it would be like oh right that's you know th like the scene you see in uh, Mr. Bean the movie right where he destroys the face of uh, uh, Whistler's mother right and that famous funny scene <laughs> That would happen, right? You could let this sit here and dry for years. You take a wet cloth and you just start wiping to clean off some dust. <gasps> Disaster. A varnish helps prevent that. A varnish goes over top. It seals the picture in. And varnish generally can be also removed. Um, so that future generations can remove the varnish, clean the painting, and restore it if it's cracked or, and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's and varnishes especially older varnish today varnish has come a long way and we have these like really high quality varnishes that will protect the painting but back then you know people would mix varnish they might use the same varnish they made they they they, per, they sealed their patio furniture in and and they would put it on top of the painting really quickly and it could be sometimes corrosive it it would definitely is not archival and it could yellow or potentially go green so I think that it's possible that this painting went green as a part as a consequence of the varnish I'm surprised I, so I don't know is this painting pre uh, restoration because a lot of these older paintings have been slowly restored over the years I don't know I really don't know anyway let's uh, continue on here we're gonna uh, maybe I'm just gonna blow dry this really quickly because there's still a bunch of wet paint over here which I've just painted you know give me a second just to stretch my legs a tiny bit here I'm gonna mute the microphone so it doesn't blow it your Okay, I just also noticed that I left a lot of this area here on his shirt. I mean, we're going to start with this side anyway, so let's just... So here's uh, just getting darker and darker on these sleeves. On this table. So this might be a few little places where black might be introduced shortly.
let's darken the chair. We're gonna make uh, a darker brown. Let's take some blue there and warm red. Uh, so I need a new tube of warm red here. Oh, that's not too much. So uh, how about let's start zooming back in. this other part it kind of starts getting you know the shirt in his back and his trousers kind of disappear into the chair a little bit unsurprisingly right because there's all just dark shadow I think it's still really important to paint them separately And I'll also say, like, as I'm, as I'm, now that I've got a really good foundation established in this painting, I can actually start to paint faster, right? I can actually pick up the pace a little bit um, as I'm working on it because um, we want more of these kind of quite aggressive brush strokes on the painting. So don't be afraid to like start, you know, just getting um, a little bit more, uh, maybe loose even with your your paint application as you progress. I think with Van Gogh, the beginning of the painting is where you establish the structure, and then as you start progressing you start uh, um, taking more liberties. So, I think this might be a good, so so. what we've done is we, we began the painting with our cool colors in the background, right? We got all the cool colors in the for the background and then we did a pass with the warm colors. Right? And then we did more cool colors in the background. And then we did a second layer of warm colors. Now what we can do, and I suspect this is what Van Gogh did, is we can start adding a little bit of those cool colors on top of the warm colors in the foreground. And even though it's, it seems like counterintuitive, because don't we want all our cool colors in the back? We can put a bit of them on the foreground because they're going to mix optically with all of that warm color and still 
kind of come forward, right? Because it's not just the color on the top layer that we see, it's all the colors underneath that are important. Um, I am just wondering, I would like to get these faces just a little bit further along before I, I jump into that because once we start doing that, then we're we're on the home stretch, and I don't know if I'm quite at the home stretch just yet. Okay, so let's take some white. Yeah, so this is definitely some glazing, looks like, in there, I think. Okay. Um... That is, it's almost like a gray. It's like a grayish brown. Strange color. Let's get some of our dark color here just to It looks it's almost a little bit horrific, um, a little scary in, in my painting, but... Some more warm yellow. 
I'm going to mix some of this. This is from my palette at the very beginning of the painting. A little bit of warm yellow I think really helps. I think eventually when I break out the black towards the very end, that's going to have a huge impact. We'll see quite a transformation of that. Still not quite. <laughs> uh, adventures of an artist trying to figure another artist's process here. So I keep sort of painting a little bit things in and out because I'm not quite satisfied with that, but I'm just going to move on down here to this greenish area on the bottom. I was, I'm trying to use this my palette that I that color that I used at the very beginning to um, put that yellow down I'm trying to economize a little bit and my it's too still too watery there's still water in there it hasn't evaporated yet
so I think I've cracked the, the code here. So what I've, I just mixed was some warm yellow with a little bit of warm blue instead. And I think it gets me a much closer to the to the color that he was using in a number of parts of this painting. So it took me a while, but now that feels like I'm a little bit more on track. Let's paint that over a little bit of the face. Almost like a glaze, they're both fairly transparent colors. I'm just going to be taking this color and just putting it all over everything. In the foreground, anyway. Alright, so all I did is took a little bit of this warm blue. And cool, sorry, cool blue and warm yellow. Which is which is different than the than the warm yellow and warm blue together. And now I've now I can see the that greenish hue that's on everything. And I even just painted over top of this face. And I'm not even using this as a glaze, I'm just painting it directly over it's, it's like I said it's pretty transparent so there we go ah I knew that there was it was the secret is there you just have to keep you have to just not give up, as I said a few times. Painting will reward you for for doing more exploring. And
Okay, so let's, I'll just zoom out so you can see how things look now. As opposed to what they looked like previously. Alright, and I'm just going to keep on, I'm just taking more of this color. just painting it, dry brushing it over everything. And then now I'll use, I'll infuse subsequent colors with this. Remember like, I mean I could have just done this at the very very end with a, gr with a glaze, but it was driving me a little bit nuts that the colors I was mixing just weren't turning out the way I wanted. Okay, the only thing is now I paint that over top of this and it actually brightens up that. So I just have to be careful um, that putting because that other cool color actually um, made this area, which is a little more subdued, brighter again. So one of the strategies would be to even take just a tad bit of white and put that in here. And I would probably add some glazing fluid to this. So let's add some glazing fluid, some warm yellow, a bit of that uh, cold blue. I think I'll darken that in another layer. And where's my... So now I'm just, I guess I could add a little bit more white into this mixture. Maybe even a little bit more blue. So, added a little bit more white, a little bit more cold blue into this warm yellow. And I'll add some glazing fluid. Just come here over the shoulders, behind the chair. Aha, okay, now we're back on track. There's a little bit it's a little disconcerting when you're painting for a while and try and mix those colors and they're just not, they just don't look the way you want them to. Sometimes it's just like, you just gotta try mixing something, like I, that did not occur to me until I was just like, okay, well I've tried everything else. The secret is here somewhere. Let's just keep on, let's just, let's just see if this works, yeah cold blue into the warm yellow. Ooh. 
So I'm doing this, and then after this, I think I'll probably just move to uh, black, I think, um, and kind of start adding finishing touches to this painting. Wow, I've definitely given her a, a, quite the hump there, haven't I? Let's see if I can uh, get rid of that. Some warm yellow, a lot more white. So this is kind of her back on the in the chair, so I'll obviously adjust all that when I come around. Ha. Not not exactly perfect, but but uh, much better than where we were. You know, this is like such a typical kind of uh, ex painting experience where you just, it, it's just, you know, it's going okay, but there's something there that is just, you know, a nagging issue that doesn't seem to uh, be resolving properly. And every, every single artist who's ever made a painting that's uh, who's ever made a painting not, not even just super successful artists you see in museums but just anyone has the experience of painting something and it just is for the life of you you just can't like what on earth why is it just fighting me like this what's what am i doing wrong And you just sort of just have to keep on going. Don't give up. I mean, maybe you take a break, go for a walk. Sometimes it's like you just forget what color you've used and you try to mix that color again. You have this like accidental, you just stumble upon the solution.
Now that's that is a little bit intense, a little bit bright. I think I'll put a little bit of warm yellow back over some of these uh, shortly, but I think it's important for me just to to brighten up. So you know, if I was to paint this painting again, I probably would make a number of, of different changes along the way. But it's always easier to do that in retrospect, right? Feel so much better now. Just took a little bit of while, so that's you know for me that's pretty stressful because <laughs> you're painting here and people are watching, and when it's not quite going the way you want, it can be kind of confusing. But there's, uh, there's no recipe for any of this. I'm, I'm kind of making the recipe right now. I'm kind of inventing the recipe. So anyone else who wants to do this now it makes it a lot easier for them. But, uh... Okay, let's go... A little bit darker here. Take this actually I just, just make I just mixed this darker color I need a little bit more uh, cold red that I was applying into that back right corner is dry. Oops. Uh, 
zoom in. Let's tackle just a few things in the background because I'm, now I'm feeling quite confident that now that I've figured out some of these problems, So I'm, gonna, I'm painting kind of dark color, a dark cold colors into the background. Um, this color is is cold blue, uh, cold red, and a bit of cold yellow, and that's it. And we get this nice dark color. There's no black in it. I would strongly encourage you to avoid using black in the background. Uh, if you do, make sure, I would put a bit of white into it and make it a, a more of a gray. Otherwise, it's just going to be too intense. Let's get a very sm another smallish brush. Let's get some Ah, goodness. Okay, so we just dropped the paintbrush onto the middle of the canvas. It's been a while since I've done that. It's okay. Just get in there with a wet cloth as quickly as possible. So I wiped some of the paint away, but... Life goes on. Uh, the reason I was, oh uh, yeah, I was getting. So now I'm just taking some, I've got some uh, uh, white with some warmy yellow. I'm just going to make a couple of lines. Up here. It's okay if they're like mine are kind of big and wide and sloppy. That's all right. lamp. I'll even paint this, the light from the lamp, this color. We'll, we're going to paint it a few different colors here momentarily, well, in a few minutes, but just 
getting some white into that area. Okay, I'm going to, uh, I think it's almost dry there. Now just sort of outlining some of these dark beams on here. Time on the clock is seven. His clock is much bigger than mine, so he can put all those the numbers and stuff on there. I, I have very limited space on my tiny canvas. this and, and then it's easier to paint those shapes on there afterwards rather than trying to paint around shapes
I think this is, again, just cold yellow, cold blue, a little bit of cold, or and cold red, just to get these darks. So I appreciate there's still so many people watching after all this time. People painting along with me. It's so exciting to to have so much company here while I'm working. I appreciate that people, despite uh, some of the struggles and that I've had in this painting, have continued. I wonder somebody solved that color problem faster than I did. Feels so much better. You know, I've made the analogy many times uh, in these episodes of that making a painting can be like riding a roller coaster. And there's just times where you're painting and everything is going really well. You feel like you're on top of the world and you just keep going up and up and up and up and up and then all of a sudden the bottom gives out and you're in a free fall you don't know what's going on what you did wrong so that's warm colors in here but i'm gonna kind of surround her Head with some cooler dark color.
Okay. Oh, it's so exciting. Now I'm so I'm back on track. So let's just, I'm going to zoom out and we'll just take a quick look and see where we're at. darken in here and then I'm going to outline <laughs> yeah I got paint on my nose didn't I yeah, like, maybe I don't know if it's, you can see it on camera but at least I think it might have wiped it off now but you start seeing like a big yellow dot on the top tip of your nose. Maybe I'm just going a little bit nuts, but um, okay. Uh, let's do. A, I'm gonna glaze a little bit for a second with this dark color. So I'm just using my my um, matte glazing fluids, satin glazing fluids. Same thing. Just want to get into a few of these a little bit darker areas. It's interesting, this child sort of has almost like an angelic glow, doesn't she? Right, the way that it, she's sort of illuminated like that. Um, which is not surprising, Van Gogh being, you know, very devout Christian, so much so that he wanted to be a priest, remember, right? And, and I think he also would want to, you know, he glorified the, the, the poor. So I think he would, the, the idea of making like the child in the center, this kind of glowing force of good and amongst all this poverty, I think was also very appealing to him. Now there is a bit of a, a striking thing where we have this, I don't, this painting kind of ends right there. I, my painting kind of expanded because I have a little bit more room on the canvas. Uh, so let's see. The question is, do you make it brighter going out here or darken inside here? I think I'm going to, I might do a little bit of both. Have a little bit of light coming back out on this side. We'll get to that shortly. I'm going to come back over down here and just use this glaze, a little bit darker color. Kind of probably do the same thing. It's almost like creating a vignette kind of quality where we have the corners are dark. And there's Ping Ping just said hello in the chat. Hi from Thailand. Hi Ping Ping. Thanks for saying hello. Very cool. Um, 
So I'm getting pretty, pretty close. You know, there's definitely some awkwardness in the faces, but um, I'm, I really like where this painting has gone to. Here's this lighter glaze coming in here. Back some, do just a little bit. Don't need to do too much there. I'm just taking, this is a, a warm yellow. Remember my warm yellow and cool blue coming back over just some of that looked a little bit too fluorescent green. Okay, I think, oh yeah, right under here. Darken when we get some black in. Oof. Okay, um, I'm going to clean a few brushes here because i got a bunch of brushes that have been sitting out for a while. So, when you should probably think about, at the, at the very least, every hour while you're painting, even if you're using that paintbrush for the full hour, is just to clean them off because um, the, oops, the paint starts to dry like as it goes up into the ferrule, into this metal part here. And, you know, after a few hours when it's, even if you're painting, the, the tip of the brush is nice and wet, but the inside um, underneath that metal is starting to harden up. And that's one one way your brushes just slowly start to, to harden, because over the painting sessions, oops, there's, my goodness gracious, Michael. <laughs> I think I got it. I got, we should be use. I got all these dirty rags over here. I, that was that was a a, a, a accident that I should have first seen coming. <laughs> Trying to clean paint off with all these dirty rags. Let's just get a clean rag.
These rags, by the way, are just like old t-shirts that I tear up. So after, rather than just throwing it in the garbage, which most people do, I can reuse it and, um, yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna, let's mix this dark, cool color again. I think I need a little bit more of it. Uh, just for the lantern, I think. And then let's zoom back in. We're painting kind of the outside edges. <laughs> that is not the, the best line that I could ever have done, but it's there. Let's move that out of the way. Again, this is something I can put a little bit of that uh, dark, or not the dark color, but you know, the color that we use, that warm yellow and um, cool blue together, we can put right over top of this. So I'll let that dry. We'll come back afterwards. I think now let's just uh, let's now that we're on kind of the home stretch here, let's start finishing off these figures and then we'll call it a day. We should be done um, within the next 30 minutes is would be my goal. So what I want to do is I'm gonna be I think at this point I am gonna break out a little bit of black. This is the first time we've used black in this entire painting. And 
Where should we put it? We barely, you're barely going to need any, even though there, it seems like this is a dark painting. Uh, the less black you put in there, the better. Because otherwise it's going to kill all of the, the life in here. So, let's take some of this black, put it on in here, and we'll mix some brown into this black. Just so that it's not just purely black, but it's got a bit of life in that dark color. Just gonna rip that off. Paula says, Wow, never thought chatting with people around the world is so exciting. Yeah, there's such a diverse international audience of people. Which, you know, just goes to show like how popular Van Gogh is and remains, you know, nearly 131 years, I think it is, after he died. I'm just gonna I'm gonna make a bigger batch of that paint. I started painting with it, and then I realized it's like kind of gummy, and it's like it's just it's no fun painting with paint that is too sticky. So uh, let's take our warm red. see some white in there hmm don't want that white at all because that white is going to infect all the other colors and, and turn it into a bit of a gray and I want a pretty intense color so let's just see we mix these together nice dark brown let's take some black There we go. Now that's just so much fun. More fun to paint with nice wet paint as opposed to the paint that's been on the canvas or the palette there for the past couple of hours and slowly drying. So. So I'm only painting black in the foreground, which is really going to help give these pop these figures out from the background, which especially since we've been playing with a little bit of warm and cool colors in non-traditional places. Um, like this 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 these lines I'm putting right now just seem like they're they're closer to me than any other lines thus far on the canvas. Remember this the size of the original can canvas is um, about well it's um, I'm painting on a 9 by 12 sized canvas the original was 44 by 33 so much bigger so if you're finding like it's hard to do these details well you're not alone <laughs> anyone trying to paint this painting at such a reduced scale is gonna have uh, a challenge right
Now, I just have to be a little bit careful not to go completely overboard with this darker color. Because um, I might re get rid of some of the nuance in the painting. Might just leave that guy's face like that. So this um, you, this is kind of a reddish black or a, a dark purplish black. So it's um, it, I'm gonna mix a, a bit more of a bluish one for his clothing, just so there's I can have a nice brown for the chair. So let's do that. Let's get a brush, some big gob of blue. In fact, uh, might even just do that on a different part of the canvas here. So this is my warm blue and black together. Very dark. You know, it's it's so fascinating to me because, you know, this painting has given me a few little fits at times. And it's kind of fun to think that, like, probably some of the same things that I, I've been kind of, like, perplexed by in this painting also gave Van Gogh some fits, right? We're talking about somebody who's, this is his first maybe real serious painting that he's ever made to really try to establish himself as an artist. And um, it didn't immediately, it didn't really work for him, right? His, uh, so as, as much as people really like this painting today, we, we talked about how this painting was rejected by the people that he was hoping would accept it, and it led to you know, I'm sure a great deal of frustration and anger and um, I think that kind of thing really sent him, catapulted him onto a path where he just kind of decided that, you know what, I tried to make a painting that everyone would like, that would get me accepted into the academy that didn't work and 
yet I was like really excited about this painting. I was so blown away. I was so, I thought this was the best thing that I ever did. They didn't like it. So rather than just sort of giving up, he just decided, you know what? I think the lesson here is not to give up, but just to continue pursuing my own path and my own goals. And that is, you know, that, that is like a, a, a really, um, that took, that I'm sure took a lot of courage to get to that point. Because many artists face that and that's the end. They just decide, you know what? I'm just uh, I'm gonna try something else. I mean, I'll maybe I'll go buy a sewing machine and get into fashion, or I'll get a, some roller skates and become a roller derby star. I don't know. Um, but he. He just decided he believed in his vision and he was going to see it through. And we're all the, the beneficiaries of, of that courage. Okay. So I just, let's just take a... I just want to show you what this looks like now that I've got that much darker color in his body in the painting. If anything, I may have gone a little bit too dark there, particularly in the face, um, but it's okay. I can always, you know, I could take that lighter color that I've used as a, um, to my warm yellow and cool blue and go back over a little bit of that and it'll kind of just soften it a bit we'll save that maybe towards the end the very very end oh i know i'm this is one of the gonna be a longer episode but you know if i'm having fun that's that's all i care about <laughs> and i this is it's a great learning experience for myself as well I, you know, I was thinking today, like, I was watching some some videos and doing some research for every one of these episodes. I usually spend about eight or nine hours, you know, getting everything ready, getting the drawings done, all that kind of stuff. I'm doing some research and writing up the Facebook post. And, um, and while I was just, I was watching a video talking about, um... Or, or just showing like the huge long lines of people going to a Van Gogh exhibition um, and just thinking like what is it about Van Gogh that appeals to so many people from so many different places around the world and um, 
you know, I think a big part of it is is that sort of fearlessness. As somebody who, despite all of the kind of struggles and rejection, just keeps moving forward. Um, just keeps waking up every day and making another painting. It's got to be, it would have been so frustrating for him to really feel like he's making breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough and sending these paintings one after another to his brother, you know, expecting like any minute the, uh, the accolades are going to start pouring in. Oops, got a little bit of paint on my hand and it not happening and um, so you know obviously people will say well he did commit suicide right so maybe like he did give up at some point well as we will talk about on our final episode this week there is quite a lot of dispute to that official story of suicide um, and some of the more recent authors who've kind of looked into Van Gogh's life and death have raised serious questions about whether he took his own life or not um, the prevailing narrative for the past hundred years is that it was a suicide, but um, more recent research sort of suggests that it might have been. Um, well, you know, I'll I'll, uh, I'll save that for another episode. <laughs> um, that's because that's what I want to talk about on the final day. Because our final episode of this series takes place on the anniversary of his death. So, that's why we're, we're celebrating Van Gogh week this week, is because it is the, like, the 131st anniversary of his death. Now, I am doing a lot of outlining, and there is the potential for this to get very cartoony very quickly. So I just have to be a little bit mindful. All of this outlining can turn the painting into um, like a comic book. And not that I have anything against comic books. We're painting it, but um, we're celebrating Steve Dicto, the, the original illustrator of Spider-Man on Saturday or Sunday and I'm currently drawing a graphic novel so I I love comic books but um, I think we just want to be careful that if I do too much outlining here I've got one two three four fingers that uh, the painting may not uh, We may not be so happy with the results. Just as a word of warning, which is why I'm, I just want to be careful. Separately. Here's just a dark green, dark warm green that I'm going to put in here.
Um, should I do the little dots for? Uh, I gotta move. I'll I'll do those little dots on the eyes. I think later. Yeah, I definitely kind of went a little bit too dark on that face. It kind of bums me out, but because uh, I I could fix that, but that's also takes more time. So. a bit more brown, dark brown. I'm just going to take a bit of this black. Ah. This is my hands have got a bunch of different paint all over them and it's causing me to get paint elsewhere on the painting. Uh, okay, let's get this show on the road, Michael. So don't worry about getting all of this super tiny detail in here, right? Just just do your best and um, don't be so hard on yourself. I'm not super happy with the way I've painted this person here. I had a canvas four times the size of it. I'm sure I could do a much better job, but I don't. So my expectations are um, somewhat tempered there. You know, the, the hands of, in the original are kind of um, a little bit more knotty, <laughs> or like they're bony than the ones I've done.
Okay. Let's get this painting done. My back is starting to kill me. I, uh, yesterday evening got my second COVID vaccine, which I'm so excited about. that for a while I don't know why I was so far down the list but oh, it's, now it's done that's great, a big relief bit sore this morning but thankfully that didn't last too long and obviously here I am so and if you haven't gotten your vaccine yet I strongly recommend it in the chat uh, question I'll get to in a second Can't help but want to do a little bit of just pops of, of light in some of these eyes. <laughs> That's a bit crazy. Uh, you don't need a lot. <laughs> this guy or woman or whoever that is it just looks a little bit berserk now so I gotta go in here Take a break here, wash a few brushes while I answer a question. 
Eleanor says, how do I transfer a guide to a different size of canvas? I was thinking of painting on a smaller canvas or a larger canvas, but I don't know how to expand or minimize a guide like the ones you provide. Probably the easiest thing would be just to go to a photocopy place and reduce it to whatever size you want. Um, if you know a little bit about how to use a photocopier yourself, you can do that. Um, but you could always ask someone at a photocopy place for some assistance to help you with that. Um, that would probably be the easiest way, yeah, is just to reduce it on the photocopy machine. If you want to enlarge it dramatically, if you want to take one of the, the templates that I provide and you want to make it four times the size of a regular sheet of paper, the photocopy machines can do that and it'll spit it out as a bunch of different pages and then you've got to stitch them together on your own. It's not too tricky to do, um, but it is a little, if you've never done it before, it is, it is a bit, uh, it, it could take you a little while to figure out and you could end up spending $20 on quarters trying to get the photocopy machine to do what you want. Um, that would, I think that would be, that's the simplest answer to do that. There, of course, you could grid it out and, or use a video projector. Uh, I showed how to use a grid in my drawing class. But it is really kind of a, a super time consuming, less maybe accurate way of doing it, which um, considering that there's other ways to do it, which uh, work just as well, if not, will cer certainly work better and are faster using the grid method is you know it's it's fun to try but if uh, I wouldn't really bother personally but Like the way that he's painted this face is just gorgeous. But that this is like that would be almost like a painting on its own for us to really go in here and, and try to learn how to do that. We're gonna be painting his self-portrait, one of his most famous self-portraits, on Thursday, so I think I'll just reserve that kind of exploration for for that particular day, just so we can get through today. Another kind of feature, we see a bit of it here in, in this early Van Gogh, is these angular lines that he, he, he's painting. Like, less, like he's, you know, he's famous for his swirls, like in Starry Night. But here we have him using some much more angular lines, which, uh, like on, on the shirt, you see like this cuff,
Okay, I'm starting to see the end of the tunnel on this painting, folks. And I wonder what, I mentioned before, what is the story that he's telling here? Like, the way that this woman is pointing down at the ground, what does that mean? Are they talking about the, they're potato eaters, so they're farmers. Are they talking about the crops of the day or the struggles that they've had? Um, you know, coming up with money or, you know, what, what is the... Um, what is that story? Hmm. Okay. This teeth kettle. bit obviously way too bright but I'm happy putting it down right now and then darkening it once it's on here Needs to be. Actually, we can just do that with some dark uh, brown lines. take a look back at this girl here because now everything else has gotten much darker and she's sort of receding back into the background so and I've got this black and warm blue that I'm painting on her torso here and that pulls her back towards us the viewer
where did I mix? Sometimes you mix a color and you're like, where did I, where did that go on my palette? It just sort of disappeared. Um, Oh my goodness, Whew. my feet are going to fall off standing here like this. What is going on down here? too bright, but uh, I'll fix that in a second. Okay, I'm so, I feel like so close. Famous last words, but um, uh, let me see. Great question, Joshua, in the chat. Um, before I get to it, let's get a bit of. I'm going to take some. Do I have any warm? Yellow, a little bit of warm yellow here. Mostly white. Get the 
this lantern. I just need, I guess I need to get some more warm yellow on the, I hate putting new paint onto the painting when I'm so close to being done because I just hate wasting it. But it's so hard to get just a little bit out. that dry for a second and then I'll put actually I'll mix a bit of red and warm yellow together Let's see if I can do this while it's still a little bit wet For a second okay so one of the final things that I want to do here is I want to go back to that mixture that I stumbled on earlier which was some warm yellow I wonder I might even just do this on my other palette here uh, some warm yellow and I gotta get more cold blue on here I guess hey eh? Warm yellow and cold blue to make this green. Oops. So, warm yellow, cold blue. Let's zoom out. And then I'm just gonna go, I'm looking for places in this painting where I might have just been a little bit too heavy handed with my darker colors, these dark lines. And by taking this, I'm just gonna take off some of the, 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 the real darkness of some of these lines and just kind of make them look a little bit more subdued. very subtle and it's just the amount of I could I can modulate how much I put in
So you know what, I'm gonna take just a, a little bit of the darker colors that I have. Just add this to that mixture. hand I gotta work on darker to go in here. Just tidy that down. Go even into the shadows up here. So I'm just Taking, making a dark glaze, right? And going over some of the parts of the painting that need just a little bit of... just too bright. Actually helps a little bit, just a bit of uh, brownish warmth on that hand. Uh, forgot about her fork there, didn't I? Okay. Let me think about uh, her 
finger here. Some warm yellow into that area. Very, very thin coat of warm yellow. Although I think I'm going to make put a little bit of white in there and just brighten. So I'm staying kind of just zoomed out right now because for me it's actually very helpful to see this painting not up close. Like my face, when I'm painting it, is quite close to the surface and having it a little zoomed out for me at these final stages is really helpful because this is the way I'll probably see this painting most of the time. If it's sitting on the wall, right, I, I'll see it from across the room. darken her outfit on the back side here. Very dark glaze going in here. so close to being done. I mean, I really, I could be done a while ago, but, uh, you know, when I get to this point and I've invested all these hours into the painting, I'm like, well, let's just keep on going. Let's make this as good as I can make it, you know. Um... So these little bits of, um, this is warm yellow and a bit of white, and I'm just using it to, to get some of the glow that we see on kind of like their noses and chins.
you. Oh, there's the cross back here. Tiny little detail. Okay. I don't know if I'm going to be making this any better over the next little while than, uh, than it is right now. I think that's pretty good. All right, I think that's okay. Um, her fork Um, okay, I think I gotta walk away here. My wife getting ready for dinner upstairs. Oh my goodness, I began this painting five hours ago. Yikes. Okay. I mean, I'm not surprised that it took me longer, that it took me this long to do. Uh, let's just zoom out just a little bit. Anytime you're dealing with this many figures in a painting, it's going to take time. That's just sort of the the unavoidable fact of doing a painting that is relatively complex like this. It just requires some time. Okay. So. I'll answer a couple of the questions I see in the chat and then bid everyone an adieu. If you enjoyed today's episode and you want to support the channel, there is a PayPal link in the description below where you can contribute a small amount or a large amount. Any amount is appreciated. Even just a dollar. Something like that helps keep this uh, channel up and running. And boy, does it feel nice to, to see those little donations come in every once in a while. Um, since there's many, many, many of you are brand new to the channel, Please like and subscribe to the channel. We had so many people from all over the world in today's stream, which is so exciting. We're going to be painting Van Gogh all week long. That looks great. I'm actually really happy with the way that turned out. Uh, it definitely... There was a, a few kind of curveballs that, uh, that this painting threw at me throughout the process of making it but I'm pretty confident that I was able to um, to figure out 
you know, uh, his secret little formula that he was working on there to get that particular green that he used throughout this painting. So, you know, which was just basically using some warm yellow and cool blue. Um, and I, I can now I see, blah, I'm just going to, I'm not going to touch, <laughs> just going to walk away. So that was, that's really satisfying. Uh, I'd see a, a few things in the chat here I'm just going to get to. Joshua would ask, what's your opinion or, or take on heavy body acrylic, liquid acrylic, soft body acrylic paints, etc.? I've been thinking about trying one of them, and I want to hear what the main artist suggestions are on it. Um, essentially, the difference between your heavy, heavy body acrylics... Is this considered a heavy body? I would probably say... This is probably close to a heavy body acrylic. Essentially, it's just how fluid the, the paint is. Um, heavy bodies are the thickest, most toothpaste like texture. And great for painting larger canvases. Um, great for doing um, like thick like when we're doing Van Gogh paintings probably heavy body is your preferred kind of um, uh, paint because he painted quite thickly right a lot of texture in those paintings if you see them in person you can look on the side and you can see the paint kind of coming off the surface uh, your as you kind of go into like your soft body acrylics fluid acrylics and then um, uh, there's a let me see I've got a bunch of So here's here's a soft body acrylic paint. Can you hear that next to the speaker? It it is moving around in there. It it it's it's more fluid than this, right? Like if I shake that next to the microphone, you don't hear any paint moving around there. It's it's like toothpaste. If you shake a toothpaste container, you're not going to hear the toothpaste sloshing around back and forth. Uh, the soft body, though, is it has it's almost like the texture of the paint that we use at the very beginning when we put down that wash. It's a lot like a, a watery kind of texture, but not not like ink. Then you have high flow acrylics. All right, you should be able to hear that. It's it's it sounds like water, right? And I also oh, I have ink. So you have high flow and then you have acrylic ink and these are fairly similar um, different applications like high flow and um, acrylic ink you should be able to put into a um, uh, airbrush right so they have the same qualities as acrylic paint they're just much thinner and therefore they can you can use them they're great for blending um, if I was, if I wanted to do a lot of really thin outlinings, almost like sign painting, you might want to think about either using soft body acrylic or a high flow acrylic, because they're just way thinner and just so much easier to paint with, right? So you could use a combination, if you found like doing really small details with heavy body acrylics are just a pain in the butt and they're driving you crazy, you could use some thinner Rather than adding thinners to the paint, like uh, glazing fluid or uh, a slow dry medium or acrylic medium, which are going to thin it, but they're also going to make the color more transparent. The, the benefit of using any of these materials, let's zoom in here, the benefit of using like your soft, uh, this, let's say in, th in terms of thickness, you have your heavy body, soft body, high flow acrylics, and then acrylic ink. Um, so, yeah. So, does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Joshua? Um, Heidi says, uh, Eleanor, I think we're talking about how to 
to tile your images and enlarge them or shrink them. For smaller size, choose a printing scale less than 100. Um, print default size. Um, Heidi says, Michael, your painting looks great. I intend to keep up, but started to fall behind very soon. I will have to go to, on my own pace. Thank you for another great class. Happy painting, everyone. And then May says, it looks great, Michael. So uh, I wonder how many of you actually watched all the way through. But, you know, it does give you a sense that, um, you know, there's when it comes to painting, it's very hard to cut corners. It's very hard to 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 make a painting like that and try to do it in half an hour like a Bob Ross like the, the thing about Bob Ross and I love Bob Ross obviously huge inspiration me doing this online and teaching in front of people like this is you know directly inspired from Bob Ross without Bob Ross I would be doing what I'm doing um, but I will say he's definitely picking compositions that can be executed very fast in half an hour or less 45 minutes right and we uh and even when i i, I did an episode of bob i did two episodes on bob ross uh back in our intro to painting class and it is hard to paint that fast like you are really um you really it takes a lot of practice to paint even his style very fast even though he's using these techniques that that make it a little bit easier but there's no way bob ross could paint like van gogh in in half an hour 45 minutes there's this I, I i would defy anyone to paint this painting maybe faster than i painted it and we're almost at six hours or yeah it's almost six hours since we began right so uh it's just like good paintings just take a little bit of time right any just like anything else making you know really good uh if you're baking or you're doing like i don't know just like i don't, I don't know i don't know the first thing about food but i know how long it takes some other people in my family to make good food and it's a whole day process right and it just you just some of the stuff just requires time um, not it's not necessarily that much more complicated I don't know if this painting was absurdly complex you can let me know in the comments how if how difficult you found it um, I think it's less difficult and just more time-consuming there are other paintings that we've done that are very difficult um, and yet can be done very quickly like Bob Ross I think is a great example I think those are deceptively difficult paintings he makes them look really easy on camera. Okay, so tomorrow we are going to be painting maybe the most, well, um, I would say of the, of all of the Van Gogh paintings that uh, we could do. He, the painting, the, the bedroom in Arles is uh, one of his most iconic images of all time. And really, again, one of the most iconic images in the history of visual art. So I'm really excited to paint uh, Van Gogh's bedroom uh, tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know why that, it sounds like I'm gonna go, go over there with a roller and, and paint the walls and everything. Um, so that's gonna be a lot of fun. And and as I think especially having painted today's painting is gonna be a good uh, primer just for me getting, it's hard switching in between all these different uh, styles. So, um, that'll be really helpful uh, and so maybe I'll be able to paint that much faster than today's painting it doesn't have any people in it which also usually takes a little bit more time okay everyone um, if you wouldn't mind uh, I know there's lots of people watching right now so if you can just press hit the like button before you leave for the day that would make me very happy um, it's a good habit to get into to, to help support your local content creator here on YouTube. It helps more people find the channel, and the more people that find channels like mine, then the more likely it is for us to support ourselves doing making more content like this. And all you got to do is press the like button. You don't even have to contribute money if you don't have a penny to spare. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock Pacific time for Van Gogh's Bedroom in Owl. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you very, very soon.
<laughs> Good night.